Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 11th International Conference on Analysis of Images, Social Networks, and Text. I am Habet Madoyan, uh, the Data Science Program Chair at the uh, College of Science and Engineering at the American University of Armenia. I want you all to welcome to our conference. Thanks, thanks for coming. And just talking about uh, AUA, about our university, we have a bunch of opportunities here. We uh, have opportunities for people who would like to teach, uh, those who would like to do research. Uh, you would, uh, if you are a speaker during the conference, then uh, please expect that uh, some of our students are going to bombard you with the questions on whether or not you'll like to supervise their capstones, their thesis programs. So please be ready for that. And please don't say no to them uh, whenever possible. So uh, I would be uh, in room 323W, that's on the third floor. You go right uh, from the elevators. Uh, and uh, so if you have any questions on what kind of cooperations you can have with the university or in general about university, about educational landscape in Armenia, please stop by. Or if you don't find me there, then you have my email here and uh, you have my Telegram uh, handler. Right, so please add uh, me and uh, send me a request so uh, we can have a chat whenever you want. Uh, now I would like to uh, give microphone to Dmitry, uh, who is another organizer of the committee. We'll talk about uh, ICE conference in general, and then we'll uh, go with our first keynote speaker. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Habit. Hello, everyone, one more time. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the steering committee and of those guys who started it all more than 10 years ago. Uh, Alexander is here, but his flight was moved three times. That's why I replaced him. And it's my duty uh, to deeply thank all uh, the local organizers for hosting us here in AUA, in Yerevan, Armenia. Uh, we are also, we are also th thankful, thankful to all uh, the program committee members, and let me also uh, let me also deliver some key facts about the conference, about its past, maybe its future. Now, according to Australian Core Ranking Conference, its original conference, um, or maybe national i don't remember it exactly you can check but we believe it will become regional we apply for that uh, for last year edition for the previous year's edition into uh, in 2021 we have more than 100 participants traditionally we have five or six tracks the main track i believe it's nlp uh, concerning the number of submissions we have, but also the large track is on computer vision data analysis. We have two smaller tracks uh, since the communities are a bit smaller on so social network analysis and theoretical machine learning and optimization. As for uh, the selection procedure, we applied uh, for double blind uh, review system several years ago and we keep going to use it uh, we have this year more than 100 pc members from 22 countries and uh, the chairs who will be chairing the sessions or the tracks they are internationally recognized area experts this year we had and we have submissions from 15 countries and the Proceedings are usually uh, booked for publishing as revised selected proceedings in LNCS, Lecture Notes in Computer Science Series, and its satellite series, CCIS by Springer Nature. So you, you can see the summary where they are indexed, uh, what they represent, and maybe some volumes from the past with a nice logo on it. <clears throat> Uh, let's shortly discuss the acceptance rate of the conference. We receive 106 technical submissions. What means technical? Some submissions can be withdrawn, for example, or desk rejected. That's why this figure is not the final one, which will appear in the proceedings. We have also 13 posters this year, 
and uh, 76 submissions after all desk rejects and withdrawals, which is quite the usual story, <clears throat> even for large conferences. The program committee decided to select 24 papers for the main volume, which results in the acceptance rates of 32%. And 22 papers selected to the supplementary volume. It means that these papers are also good enough, uh, but maybe they are more like research proposals that uh, have some room for future improvements, as say, you no know, journal papers. Uh, let's have a look at the statistics by track, which the system called Easy Chair present for us. Um, you can see the, the names of tracks on the left, and uh, you can see the number of submissions per track, the effective uh, number of accepted papers is shown in the second uh, or third column. So you can see also uh, the relative acceptance rate and the number of PC chair by PC, PC chairs and program committee members included in the track. Uh, International Committee of Area Chairs consists usually of two chairs per track. For some larger track, there might be three co-chairs, but this year's our brave natural language processing co-chairs Manage, uh, managed to select papers together before there were three persons, I believe. Uh, all of them are known researchers in the area, as it was said. As for the organizing committee, I believe this is not far the full list of all the people involved, but you can see the names Irina Nikishina, Maxim Panov, Habet Madayan, Amalia Hambertsum. Ambertsumyan, Evgeny Tsimbalov, me, and Alexander Panchenko. Uh, Alexander decided to include some of the influential papers in terms of citations here. So the one here by Mikhail Korobov has probably the topmost number of citations. Um, it's about a morphological analyzer and generator for Russian and Ukrainian languages. Most cited papers also include the paper on web vectors, and I believe uh, that the first person, Andrei Kutuzov, will join us online uh, this time. Also, one of the influential papers is on Big IRTM, on topic modeling tool. Uh, developed by the team chaired by Konstantin Voronsov. He's quite known in the Russian machine learning community. Here you can also see some photos from uh, the previous edition of IST. It took place, I would say, nearby in Georgia in 2021. <clears throat> we would like to acknowledge our partners and supporters. AI Research Institute, uh, Mrs. Caltech uh, University, where I also work in, HSC University, in addition to uh, the local uh, host. So I think it's a good time to start. Let's start. I hope it will be a pleasant event for all who are here and online. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to invite our first keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Narina Sarvazian, uh, who is a uh, William Fraser Endowed Chair Professor at the American University of Armenia. Please welcome. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to AVA. Uh, we all know very well that Armenia goes through one of the darkest periods of his history with tens of thousands of people losing their ancestral homes. And it's very hard for us to be cheerful hosts, but we're trying. I think Desmond Tudu once says that hope is ability to see light despite all the darkness. So I think it's only appropriate that today we're going to talk about light, specifically what is light without colors. 
So that's what we're going to talk today about it. And with this, let me figure out. So my talk will consist of four parts. Uh, I'm going to talk about the limitation of our color visions. I'm going to talk about the basic physics uh, foundation of this technology, which going, uh, we're going to be, get more familiar with medical application of it, and a little bit about what is done, uh, was done uh, by my team in the past in this direction. So color been used for medical diagnostic for thousands of years. You know, it was something which physician look, color of your eyes, color of the skin, color of the urine, and there are plenty of uh, very cute uh, illustration like this in the medieval books where by the color of different fluids or part of the body, the disease was diagnosed. However, you know, uh, we need to realize that as useful as it was, that information was limited to a very small spectral range, something which we'll call visible light range. So if you look at electromagnetic uh, spectra range, the visible light is only from 400 to 700 nanometers. And uh, we have only few type of re uh, receptors, which we call cones, actually only three of them, which in our eyes are sensitive to certain wavelengths of color. So we're going to briefly go over the main limitations of human color vision, and then I'm going to explain to you how this new technology allowed to overcome these limitations. So, as I said, one of the major limitations that we start with a very few spectral uh, bands, so to speak, or the receptors we have in our eyes, which we call cones. So, and many animals which are much more primitive than us, for example, this mantis shrimp, have many more receptors in their eyes. But because we couple our few receptors with this enormous human brain, our human vision actually is able to recognize up to 6 million different shades of color. So we're talking about the combination of the initial input, which is this number of spectral channels, and how you analyze them. But in our case, that spectral input, the initial one, is actually very limited. So the next major limitation is subjective. You know, when you go to the store and you pick up type of wood or hair color dye or anything you want, we use these very subjective descriptions, which is okay when you're a buyer, but go to dermatologists and tell them that your you know, skin uh, area went from stolen kisses to hot pants or something like this. It's a very subjective way of describing what we have. And when you go to one physician to another, or when you perceive that degree of redness through the treatment or the time, it's all extremely subjective. In addition to inability to compare it between different person and different time points, our perception of color in our brain, it very much depends on what surrounds that uh, object. For example, if you look at Ararat in the morning or in the evening, uh, it might look you know, very different to you. But in fact, if you remove the background, the color of many object is identical. It's just surrounding of that color which impacts your perception of the color. So it's not objective. And in addition to that, you know, we all have a different genetic composition of those color receptors. So when I go with my husband to the store to pick up a sweater, very often I say, oh, it's a nice green sweater. And he said, no, it's brown. So we all know that our perception of color is not uh, totally subjective. So the third, as I mentioned, it's a limited spectral range. So we are seeing in that we are sensitive to that uh, spectral range from 400 to 700. And insects or reptiles actually can see in infrared and uh, ultraviolet range. And so when insects approach the uh, flower, the one which you just see yellow, he or she, whatever this little creature, see many more uh, shades of color than we are. And lastly, our eyes actually need a lot of light in order to be able to distinguish color. So we all know that famous phrase that you know all cats dark 
uh, looks great at night. So in order for color to be perceived, you need quite a bit of color. Uh, light and so there are two different modalities of way we can see light coming from the object in case of reflectance we shine something and whatever comes back it's actually uh, has a lot of intensity so it's easy to see but many objects specifically biological they have another property which is called fluorescence it's when the light hit the subject and then it's elicit response from the molecules in that subject to emit light at longer wavelengths and it's called fluorescent. That light, it can only be seen when everything, the other colors in the room are darkened. And that light is very hard to see by the human eye. So if this is, if these are the limitations I talked about, the technology we're going to cover, hyperspectral imaging is actually covering and able to address all of them. Okay, so what is hyperspectral imaging? To be honest, uh, I think uh, from the linguistic point of view, it will be more appropriate to call it spectral imaging, but somebody named it hyperspectral and the name stuck. So now we are with hyperspectral imaging and it's basically relate more to the analysis or uh, acquiring the light in the visible near infrared and ultraviolet area of spectra because spectra can be different you have a raman spectra and another but hyperspectral imaging is basically analyzing the uh, light in a visible little bit of ultraviolet and infrared range so the way it works is that if you have an object you basically acquire the information in this three-dimensional way you have your spatial coordinates x and y and you're adding the third dimension, which is your spectral dimension or lambda. Then from each pixel of that three-dimensional data set, you extract the spectral profile or basically intensity of the signal along the uh, lambda axis. And then you let the machine to sort these uh, pixels and based on whatever task you give the machine saying, find me two ranges of pixels which are the farther from another or find me all possible combination and then you suit the color those pixels which are closest to specific spectral profile and you get what is called composite HSI image. So when there are only few spectral bands and they kind of are far apart or some apart it's called multispectral when as a result of that extraction you get more or less continuous spectra that's called hyperspectral imaging okay so how we can acquire this set of information it really depends on the type of the scanning you do and all of them have certain advantages and disadvantages so in case of when you have a when you want to have a very high uh, spectral resolution uh, you do point scanning basically you go pixel by pixel and then you just acquire the full spectral information here. Uh, you can also do this linear scanning, which is more appropriate for when your object moving beneath the sensor, or if you have that camera mounted on a plane or a drone and it flies over the certain area. This way, it basically goes and acquire this uh, spectral information from that uh, area you want to scan. Uh, most commonly what we're going to talk today will be done through uh, what is called wavelength scan. Basically you have a regular camera on top of the object and you change the set of filters in front of it. So every time you snap an uh, image, you do it at the specific wavelength. And so you fill your cube from down up. And for the past few years, there is a huge develop in the photonic fields where people came up with a smart way of actually splitting that uh, image coming from the object into many multiple uh, area on a large sensor so you can get all this spectral information at once. So this is basically the same type of information here. I just highlighted that what are the advantages of this of these approaches. So in this case, you get very high spectral resolution, very slow acquisition. Here you have a medium, but again, you use for moving targets. This is the high spatial resolution, but because you need to sequentially change that filter in front of the camera, it's relatively slow. 
This one can be very fast and can be used for video HSI, but in this case, because you're dividing your sensor tips in multiple squares, the spatial resolution is not that high. So the spectral camera uh, have a wide range uh, of price, but generally uh, the price is from 2200K. Okay, so what are the advantages? Well, the advantages, especially when applied to medicine, this is a non-evasive approach. You don't need to introduce any contrast dye. You don't need to touch the subject. You just take an images from it. So uh, no radiation there. Uh, you reveal small difference in color, which your uh, eye might not be able to see. You have basically the resolution is half of the wavelength. So we're talking about fraction of the microns. So let's say compared to X-ray, MRI, or anything else, it's a very high spatial resolution. And again, the most important, you can quantively, uh, quantify objectively uh, the color change or uh, difference between the color of different objects. So what are the uh, limitations? Well, the main limitation is just like our eyesight, we only can get information from the surface. It's not like the x-ray you can go through and see your bones. Because the uh, you know light will go probably maximum to half millimeter or millimeter into the tissue, but it will not go more. You know, for it to be effective, you need to know exactly in which spe application specific ranges this uh, uh, will. Let me see my timing. Okay. So, uh, where you actually need to acquire this information, uh, you need to have pretty significant time spent on post processing. And then, whatever algorithms you use is going to affect whatever you're going to get as a final image. So there is a certain subjectivity based on the algorithms or uh, the user who processes the data. Okay, so basically, in a very simple way, is that we're combining the advantages of this insect or whatever lower creature uh, eye, which has multiple channel but has a very little brain, with our eye, which has very few spectral channel but very large brain, and then we're using the machine to get these multiple channels, and then we use the computer power to analyze the signals which are coming from these spectral channels. Okay, so let's move to the uh, medical application of hyperspectral imaging, because this is where future lies uh, for many uh, medical applications, but uh, this technology doesn't come from medical field. It's come actually from uh, military applications, from astronomy, from material science. And now uh, this technology is very widely used for in many areas of, uh, you know, application, not necessarily medical. In agriculture, uh, basically many farmers in Europe or United States, they use hyperspectral cameras flying over their fields uh, and then they can realize where you have spe certain need for watering or some kind of disease. We actually have a company here in Armenia which analyzes those images obtained in US. They get transferred here. The team here analyze it and send it back to US farmers to you know better fertilize their fields. Uh, the hyperspectral imaging is very widely used in recycling because plastic, which look by to eye very similar or all kind of transparent white. If you shine ultraviolet light, the fluorescence will be very different between these different type of plastics. So it's very easy to use it to sort plastic. You can inspect uh, boards. You can detect a uh, counterfeit in, uh, for example, you know, different currency. It's uh, used a lot in art uh, forgery detection because the spectra of the dye, which was used in 13th century, as similar it might look to you when you look at with your human eyes, will be different when you use a contemporary uh, uh, paint. So using this hyperspectral imaging analysis to analyze uh, the differences really help to identify forged art. Uh, it's used widely for the food detection when you see those tomatoes or apples going through the conveyor belt and you want to select the ones which are not fully ripe or have some damage into it. Do you have a hyperspectral 
uh, cameras on top of that conveyor belt, which then uh, allow things to be sorted. So the way the hyperspectral camera can be mounted, <coughs> they be, can be mounted on the drones or any kind of aerial vehicle. Again, this is the example how it's used in architecture. You can mount on the microscope and then you look at the slides or actually live uh, cells and then mix the fluorescent labels there. Or you can just basically mount it uh, and just have a regular uh, camera objective and then you look at the microscopic surfaces like your arm, your uh, mouse or whatever you want. So uh, again, uh, this technology is already widely used in many fields, but in medicine it's only uh, starting. So you can see here the increase in the amount of publications on a PubMed, which again look like a big number, but compared to overall amount of articles online, it's actually small number. So this is emerging field and one of the reason I'm happy uh, that you will know more about it because I think many of the techniques you use for different applications are directly applicable to this field and the technology is only bring it to more and more uh, medical applications where your expertise can be very useful. So there are just starting to appear actually first handheld hyperspectral uh, uh, imaging devices for clinical use. And I didn't want to bring more uh, gruesome pictures from real, you know, necrotic or diabetic food, but it's obviously that, you know, if you have a camera, you can look at the skin condition and see deterioration or improvement in perfusion index and stuff like this, something which can be easily see on the surface of the skin. Uh, it also can be during the intraoperative mapping uh, when oxygen bind to the hemoglobin molecule, the spectra shifts a little bit. And so when it shifts significantly, you know there's a difference in between your venous and your arterial blood, right? One is bluer, another is redder. But you can have much smaller shift also identified. And so this is an example where hyperspectral camera was used to actually see that the surgeon was going to cut or you know put a tie over here, but in fact this is like a, not the exact area where it should be put. Uh, so you can see that the area which need to be dissected is actually below. So visually you cannot really distinguish it, but use of hyperspectral imaging can be uh, very helpful. Another area where it's you know, going to grow is, uh, you know, the transplantation of the organs when uh, it's only less than 1% of the people who need organs actually receive them. So any organs which being uh, excised from the another person who cannot survive and get transported to the final destination, it's extremely critical to know the condition of the organ because otherwise you're going to have a person with poorly functioning liver and you're going to put liver which is seem to be okay, but actually this person will be dead in a couple of days. So the way to do it is that when they transport these uh, organs, the color of the organs, despite all the effort, is going to start changing because of the oxygen level and stuff like this. And so, again, there is a very straightforward way to analyze it using hyperspectral imaging by change in the color. And so you can see the changes on the level, not just the whole organ, but the specific area, maybe which of some of them you can dissect to avoid future necrosis. Uh, there are a few research papers on the subject of uh, intraoperative uh, HSI during brain surgery. This is an example from uh, first paper. Again, these are preclinical, uh, first clinical, but again, awaiting larger clinical trials where they try to dissect neuroblastoma. And this is a combination of actually input from the hyperspectral camera and uh, most of the paper actually is then devoted to the way they use the neural networks to uh, extract the maximum amount of information. And as paper conclude, the accuracy was 80%, which is outperforming the state of the art approaches. 80% doesn't sound look to me, uh, good to me, but I guess in this field, this number is actually uh, very good. So there is a term now, which is called optical biopsy. Then the uh, catheter or, you know, uh, some kind of uh, endoscope can go 
close to the tissue, acquire the spectra, it get analyzed, and you can correlate it with the similar changes occurring in uh, cancer uh, patients with a similar pathology. Uh, one of the most fascinating directions for me uh, is this a few years ago, uh, it was discovered that attaching hyperspectral camera to the fundus camera, which is the one we look into your retina when you go to uh, check your eyesight, uh, the eye is the extension of your brain. So those uh, proteins which get deposited in the brain, bleta amyloid, tau proteins, and lead to uh, decrease in your mental capacity, Alzheimer, and other dimension, apparently they also get deposited in that retinal uh, area. So by acquiring, simply acquiring this information from the retinal surface, uh, there can be prediction made that this person is actually starting to develop early sign of Alzheimer's, and everyone in the field believe if you can start treatment early, you can delay that process. So this is exactly, this is a very exciting development because again, it's non-invasive and you can see the early sites of disease, but it's only like one or two groups now uh, in Europe which are exploring it. And I think it's uh, definitely something which need to be uh, studied further. So when I mentioned, and I guess we we'll already kind of see it, but when I mentioned that hyperspectral imaging is limited to surface, it doesn't mean it's only surface of the skin, pretty much if you get into, if you can open a surgery, or if you can get something like an endoscope attached to the hyperspectral camera, you can go inside the body and look at the surfaces there. And so it's not just a, a, what is on a, a surface of our body, but it's also what is inside. Another major developing medical field, which will take time because <laughs> pathologists are probably the most conservative uh, medical professional, uh, and it's hard to convince them this is the way of the future, but eventually it will happen. Uh, you probably know that uh, if you need to diagnose certain disease, uh, small pieces of tissue is taken, stained with specific dye, sent to histology, and then a very experienced histologist look at the slide and say, well, there's a little bit of these cells, there's a little bit of this color, and so I think this is this or this type of, you know, cancer or any kind of uh, other disease. So, Again, this information, A, is uh, subjective, B, it's very, very much depend on expertise of this particular pathologist. So now using hyperspectral imaging, and there are now machines where you can just feed thousands of slides like this, uh, uh, and then uh, it will scan it, and then it will uh, automatically identify a difference in color and then individual spectral component can be quantified, so you can exactly say that you have, you know, a decrease or increase of number of certain cells during the period of time, or you can compare it to other, uh, you know, pathologists who gave you similar or different uh, diagnosis. Okay, so it's all, okay, so it's all, uh, looks wonderful when you look at the final slides of any paper, but uh, in my last part I want to s just tell you a little bit about the work we done in my lab at George Washington University, and it's just happened because in the past I did uh, research in a, a cardiac field that the target we chose was probably one of the hardest at all. We chose the inner surfaces of the card to be able to, uh, you know, diagnose using this technology. So, but first let me, uh, hopefully I will be able to play some of those uh, videos. So, uh, we're, going about we're going to talk about treatment of the most common cardiac arrhythmia, which is atrial fibrillation. So, it's not fatal, uh, because it's when your ventricle actually starts fibrillate, then you drop that, because uh, brain does not receive any blood. But when your, uh, when your atria fibrillate, it doesn't really impact you immediately. But what happened in those uh, pockets of this atria, you have bloods, blood clots accumulating. So your likelihood of getting stroke increased five times. So when people have atrial fibrillation, first they treat it with drugs, but ultimately the best way to treat is go inside the heart and ablate using different type of ways of killing the tissue. One of the common, most common one is called radiofrequency ablation, and I just want to play some videos so 
this may be kind of will be more interesting just so. okay so here if this is your heart and you just basically these are the yeah, atrium mm -hmm. and you can see that those abnormal sources of electrical activity which looks like this you know little stars are start randomly to go around and then you don't have a regular pumping so blood can not flow in a systematic way you form blood clots so the way to treat it so basically physician goes into your vein can be your uh, groin or can be your arm and then uh, they insert it it goes into your heart and uh, because there is an x-ray machine on top of you, you can actually see the uh, the exact location where the catheter goes there are actually two of them one is called mapping catheter which record the electrical activity from the surface of the atria this is your mapping and then based on this uh, mapping signals uh, then the other machine can derive the spot where this abnormal activity actually originate so then the ablation catheter goes and basically isolate those area where the uh, troublemakers are uh, coming so at the end on the screen the surgeon sees that pattern and then machine reconstructs where the signals come from so you can see this red area is where the signal comes from and that's what they need to ablate they don't want to ablate entire heart or entire surface because then you're going to have a scar and it's going to be hard to even like get blood in because it's going to be very stiff so you want to have a very targeted ablation to just remove those abnormal sources so at the end basically again here you can see this uh, the point of the ablation catheter which goes and touches this area and then machine records exactly where catheter already been so they don't go back and uh, ablate the same spot so if you go to that surgical room, you really feel like you're on a spaceship because there are like five different monitors showing all these beautiful things. You have a person lying there. And again, it looks very sci-fi, but they still don't see the actual damage to the tissue. Just only see indirect information that the catheter was there and there is a decrease in electrical activity. It can happen because you have an edema, you have, uh, you know, wrong area. And so still there is a 30% of recurrence rate for the atrial fibrillation ablation. So person goes home, then the uh, problem reappears, they need to come back. So our lab decided to use hyperspectral imaging to help uh, improve this particular surgical treatment. So first we needed to uh, figure out whether it's better to acquire this light in a, uh, in a reflectance mode or fluorescent mode. And the second, post-acquisition, we needed to figure out how to do that processing first uh, uh, quickly, because again, we're talking about the beating heart, so things need to be done almost real time. So this is just a raw da data from our hyperspectral cameras, which shows that this is the surface which you see under ultraviolet light and this is under visible light you don't see any lesion by eye but uh, in an ultraviolet light you see three of them much better than in a reflected so the uh, right side is the outcome of the hyperspectral imaging and processing of this uh, stack of the data so the biological data are extremely noisy. That's one of the problems you need to uh, kind of uh, realize is that, so this is an example, for example, even after you normalize the signal, you can see the trends. These are uh, 14 different individual animals with different lesions. And uh, in the white light illumination, the, uh, this, uh, the noise, so to speak, or the, you still see some trends, but in a ultraviolet, range uh, when we illuminate with UV and take fluorescence is actually a little bit more consistent. So that's the first step for us was to figure out what way of illumination to use. And then we proceeded to test this technology starting the small animals and then larger animals and then finally human tissue. So this is an example how the atria, excised atria from the peak heart looks. So you can see this is how it looks under the white light. And then uh, 
on the right, you can see how it looks under UV light. Again, lesions are kind of seen, but very, very poorly. And when you use hyperspectral cube, this is a difference in spectra. You can see the differences are very small, only a few percent. Nevertheless, unmixing it leads to the very uh, clear pattern. So uh, when we move to the harder tissue, because it has a thicker layer of collagen on the top of the atria, and so it's much harder to see any lesions, uh, we were still able, and this is the surface of the, this is the excised human heart. We're not <laughs> murderers, but we had an agreement with the transplant uh, center in uh, Washington, D.C., so when they have a heart not suitable for transplantation, they call the lab and say, okay, I'll come and pick it up. So that's where this heart uh, comes from, from that source. So anyway, so this is the uh, surface of the uh, left atria, and you see how much collagen it has. And if you uh, strip it or pull it away and stain it with the dye which identify the ablated area, they are there. But again, from the surface, you don't see them. Nevertheless, hyperspectral imaging worked uh, reasonably well. So this is obviously the best case scenario, uh, but overall it was good enough for us to say, okay, let's proceed with something uh, resembling clinical device. In addition, what we saw is that uh, uh, to our surprise, as I told you, we really don't see with this technology deep, right? Because it's only surface. But when we did the correlation between the depths of the lesion and degree of spectral change, we saw that we actually see how uh, see or reveal how deep are the lesion. And again, it goes against my physics background, but then after you know many nights of thinking how it's possible, I realized that this is an indirect correlation. When you have a piece of steak and you have something hot, like uh, you know applying to it, if it's become a little bit whiter, you didn't you didn't heat it deep enough. If you have more heat, it's going to be deeper lesion, it's going to get whiter. So basically the degree of spectral change on the surface is indirect indication how deep the lesion will be. So that technology was surprisingly good also in this, which is important for clinician because they want to do transmural uh, ablation. And so we then proceeded partnering with the company uh, and uh, created this first hyperspectral intracardiac percutaneous uh, catheter and this is just show that how we have this uh, uh, catheter entering the heart uh, so uh, one of the problems again now we go through a little bit of uh, problems we encounter so uh, if you have a uh, blood in the tissue it's optically dense so basically it absorbs everything so a, a question was, well, we have a perfused tissue, will we have a difference in spectra? Because one thing to have it on a bench, another when you have it in a living individual or animal. So as you can see here, we can perfectly identify a different area when we have a blood inside. This is just an example of the uh, fresh lesion and the scar tissue, which again can be easily distinguished. And these are the vessels which are actually coming from the scar and feeding this border area, which was very interesting uh, finding. But this is when the blood is inside, so it doesn't really uh, uh, interfere. But if you're going to have a blood right in front of your sensor, it's going to block everything. It's like a dark wall. So we needed to insert the balloon. So we have a balloon here which is filled with uh, saline which basically work when you insert the catheter, then balloon get inflated by saline and it displays the uh, fluid in front of it. And then uh, we needed to do things quickly because again, it's a beating heart. So then we did a lot of analysis on the data uh, and trying to minimize uh, the amount of channels we actually need. So we went from initial 151 channel to three and still, obviously, the outcome was noisier, but we were able to unmix and see the lesions. And then we also realized that some of the balloon materials, which used very widely in clinical practice, is very fluorescent. So we have to search and characterize different fluorescent material for this material not block our signal. So I'm just telling you this to tell you that in any application you're going to encounter differences, differences with difficulties which will you need to solve. 
So I'm approaching the end of my talk. I want to acknowledge the people in my GW lab, which do those experiments on hyperspectral imaging of atrial tissues. And I also want to uh, mention that uh, here at AUA, I also want to continue on this promising direction. And uh, one of the developments uh, we want to implement, which hasn't done bef done uh, ever before, and I think that's very exciting to me, is that we're not going to only uh, acquire the spectral information along the axis on the emission side, but we're also going to scan on the excitation side. So we on, we're not going to have a three-dimensional data set like we had before, but we're going to have a four-dimensional data set, which is now possible with a combination of the tunable light sources and uh, snapshot cameras. So you tune on the uh, side of the light which you illuminate, and then you acquire the full spectral output on the light which comes from the object. And so we already shown that it's much more sensitive approach, but work is only started. And we have a, a faculty here from AVA, we, as whom we collaborate, uh, hoping to also add some new advanced uh, image processing algorithms to this field. So this is just a very quick overview of what this field is going to experience very soon. And I think in red, I mark something which you all guys have more expertise than I do because I am experimental physiologist. Uh, but this is, again, it's an emerging field fueled by advances in optics and advances in machine learning. And you are welcome to contact me to see how you can or want to collaborate or just read more about hyperspectral imaging and find somebody in your area who work on this because this is going to be something big. And in the next, I don't know, five, 10 years, when you go to the physician office, I'm sure there will be hyperspectral imaging somewhere, which will be pointing to your own body. So with that, I'm ready to take any of your questions. Thank you, Dr. Sarvazian. Uh, do we have any questions? Yes. Hey, thank you for the of a great talk. I'm not familiar with the field, so my question is kind of general. How the multidisciplinary process looks like? Basically, you have researchers on machine learning side and doctors. Is there any annotation process? How usually you describe to doctor and um, experts in medicine your results? What's the outcome response? So could you please say about it? It's very enriching for everyone, and uh, <laughs> sometimes it can be uh, fun, sometimes it can be very gruesome. I remember we had a conversation with the vascular surgeon, and we're talking about applying our cameras to uh, like a diabetic foot or some cases where they have to the amputate the leg. And he said, oh, no problem, I can bring you 10 amputated legs to your lab, and you can just measure it. He said, no, 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 I don't want to have. 10 amputated lab and legs lying around. So I think their perception of what is easy and our perception of what is doable or easy is very different. So, uh, but I think, you know, I started as just, uh, I mean, I my base education was in physics, but then I moved closer, closer to physiology. And, but the past 10 years, I made this journey from just being a lab researchers to collaborate it with people from the company who made the new devices from the clinicians who need to test those devices. And I don't want to even talk about the lawyers and patents and like all this stuff. This is like yet another whole field which you need to learn. But ultimately, if you want to bring something you do in your lab into actual practical field, you need to do that. So it takes a lot of time and it takes, I don't know, several months at least to explain to them what you can do and what they have or they can offer to you as far as patient population, how they want to see the data. Many things which we said, okay, well, that's easy. Let's just do that. They say, well, I only have like two patients in a year. There's no way we're going to get enough data. So that conversation is very important. Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you very much for a nice talk, uh, Vladimir Ivanov from Monopolis. I, I have rather like uh, may, maybe the same question as Yelena uh, about the possibility of interpretation, because what you did, uh, uh, what you explained in the first part of the talk is this difference between perception of human uh, being uh, the color and the hyperspectral colors. And as I understand, you use the, uh, or some of the researchers use the CNNs, like convolutional neural networks, and they solve some tasks like with a certain precision. But do, do you know about some research or some works in the interpretation of this kind of information? Because it's uh, beyond the human perception. Uh, maybe doctors feel it somehow, but uh, how how the research in this direction right. is going? So I think it's the, I mean, it's a very important question. So there's always question of ground truth, right? So I think at this point, we, we don't we, we don't have a better tools than actually go to whatever Pato let's say set of pathologists which can say this is the condition okay or in case of the hyperspectral uh, imaging of the lesions for example staining with ttc which is the dye which identify like a necrotic tissue where you can clearly see it's like become very different color and you just take a regular image and you compare the result of the hsi and mixing with that image which is again ground truth so at this point we don't have a better tool than what was known before and identified by physician as this is the damage. We need to go from there. And then the next step, we'll see if the hyperspectral imaging give you something. Let's say again, like for example, this area where physician or surgeon put the uh, knife and say, we need to cut here. But actually hyperspectral imaging saying, okay, no, half of the legs still have a normal perfusion. Stop, you don't need to cut that much. But we cannot immediately do the step, right? Because we can start with this and say, okay, let's have a population of patients. 10 of them will treat old way. The 10 of them will treat the new way based on HSI. And we'll see what the outcomes will be. If HSI outcomes are better, then this is justification to have a larger clinical trial. And that's how it moves. You're welcome. I have one more question. Uh, thank you for an interesting talk. I'll try to be brief. I have more of a technical question, uh, actually. Uh, so when there is a hyperspectral image of the human heart, this filters all different wavelengths. Uh, are, they are they acquired simultaneously or with uh, some like filter by filter as in satellites? So these experiments I was showing you, uh, we used the old style hyperspectral mm -hmm. camera where you have a just black and white sensors or gray, mm -hmm. whatever, and then in front of it you have a liquid tunable filter where it's just a crystal which then you sequentially mm -hmm. dial, so to speak. But that's why we needed to go from 151 initial sandals to just three to make it faster, right? Mm -hmm. Because we do it with a beating heart. Uh, now we just acquired for $22,000 uh, snapshot hyperspectral camera, which can acquire the whole, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, 20 channels in like millisecond range. So now you can do it mm -hmm. much faster. The resolution, spectral resolution will be less, but you can do it much faster. That's what I'm saying. These techniques are coming from mm -hmm. the photonics fields and we'll have a camera which allow you to do it uh, pretty efficiently at basically video rate. Uh, yeah, so uh, the question uh, maybe more around if you just obtain these snapshots on different wavelengths in different times, so uh -huh. they maybe kind of changed a bit because it's, I don't know, moving hard and exactly. stuff. So are there some processing algorithms to do it, uh, like to merge this into some static stuff? Yeah, Thanks. so what it done in not only this field, but in any cardiac images, it's called gating. So in parallel, you have an ECG acquisition. So you gate your acquisition to that diastolic period of the heart when it's not moving. So it's not enough light to get from one diastolic period. So you do it and you just sum it up over, let's say, 20. So you add this and you enhance the intensity of each pixel and that's enough for you to unmix. So, but in the heart, it's easier because it's a regularly beating organ. So you can gate it to a CG, uh, EKG. Uh, basically, but yeah, you in the again, we choose the hardest object to study. So it has a blood in front of the surface, it's beating. You need to get into the heart through the extremely small, and that catheter needs to be bent 
which is also a problem for any fiber optics to have a bendability index enough to go in. But eventually, we hope it will be solved. Okay, so I'll start. Uh, my name is Evgeny Arlov, and I'm going to present our paper, which is titled Paraphrases and Classifiers, Controllable Text Generation for Textile Tensor. So first, um, let's talk about the motivation behind this research. So uh, the task that we are solving is textile transfer, which is an important task for um, and products that use NLP because it makes uh, these products more user-centered as it is connected with emotions. Um, and re in the recent years, textile transfer has seen great progress with uh, large pre-trained language models, but they are often too big uh, to fine-tune for downstream tasks. So one of the solutions to this problem is to use methods of controllable text generation and more precisely a, uh, the post-processing group of these methods which do not aim at uh, fine-tuning the original L uh, language model, but uh, on the other, other, other hand, they just uh, work in a post-processing manner only, only during inference. Um, and uh, another thing is that uh, unsuper uh, unsupervised approaches are more preferable as uh, for many textile transfer uh, tasks, uh, parallel data are not available. And therefore, yeah, we, we should go with unsupervised approaches. Yeah, so in our paper, we adapt an existing CTG method, controllable text generation method for textile transfer, uh, transfer which is called KAIF. And uh, the advantage uh, of our method is that it, it results into an unsupervised method. And we apply ParaKaif to a uh, textile transfer subtask detoxification, and we work with two languages, Russian and English. So first, let's talk about the controllable text generation in general. Uh, we can say that contemporary language models have acquired the possibility of generating human-like sounding text, but uh, we, uh, but the control is still, we are lacking some control of these models because, uh, because of the downstream uh, specifics, uh, downstream application specifics. And uh, also, uh, we need to control the models because they were trained on uncleaned, uh, often uncleaned web data, and therefore they are prone to generating toxicity, toxicity, uh, toxic content. Um, yeah, so uh, there are three broad groups of uh, controllable text generation methods. And the first two, they actually work with the original model and somehow, um, well, interact with it, either retrain or refactor. And the, the third group is our post-processing methods. Um, which uh, do not interact uh, uh, with the original mo model, and that's just what we need. So here is, is an example of a post-processing CCG method. It's called JEDI, and the main idea here is that, uh, for example, if the task is uh, to generate um, uh, positive text, we train two additional uh, class conditional language models, and during generation with the main uh, with the main model, we um, uh, combine the signals from, from the two uh, class conditional models and result into the desired class generation. So the, the method that we are working with and with the one with that we are adapting is uh, called KAIF and, and it is clo clo close to JEDI, but the uh, difference is that instead of a generative classifier, uh, the con class conditional language models, it uses a um, uh, a freeform classifier. So the idea is that during generation, at every generation step, we assess all the possible uh, continuation tokens with the uh, classifier. So we uh, apply the classifier to all possible well, uh, uh, sequences uh, at the moment, and we choose choose the most appropriate to, uh, uh, the most appropriate uh, uh, continuation uh, uh, according to our goals. So uh, one, uh, you could guess that one, uh, that some problem with this method could be that uh, the, uh, it is computationally uh, difficult to apply the classifier to all the possible tokens. The, the vocabulary can be very big. So uh, uh, the authors propose uh, uh, several tricks to, to tackle this problem. First, they limit the, the, the number of tokens that are being assessed to a some number j, which is set to 100 in the, in the experience. And 
uh, also they apply an entropy criterion. So uh, they, uh, they suggest applying the classifier um, uh, only at, at points where the entropy is high. So the, it is important at, at points where uh, it is important to, to guide the model. Um, yeah, so textile transfer, uh, the task that we are uh, applying our method to is uh, important because it can, it can be used in, for example, uh, writing assistance and uh, chatbots. Uh, because um, uh, it can alter the text to your needs. And the, the formulation of the uh, task is that we have to change the, um, uh, the attribute, the style attribute of the original sentence to the target uh, uh, style attribute. And uh, yeah, there are d different uh, subtasks and data sets for, uh, for this task, including toxicity. And uh, the important thing is that, um, uh, as I have said, um, not many uh, textile transfer subtasks have parallel data, so we have to account for that. Yeah, the particular textile transfer subtask that they are, we are working with is detoxification. Is it, it is relatively new, but yet uh, very practical because, well, the internet is, uh, has provided space for, for toxic content. And uh, yeah, as you could guess, the task is to uh, transfer the original toxic sentence into a neutral sentence. And the one possible application of this task could be that, for example, if a user writes a, a toxic content, we could just, at, the, at this moment, um, uh, provide uh, them with a non-toxic rewrite of the text that, that they have just written. So uh, speaking about the research in this area, work has been done for English, however, uh, parallel data are, are lacking, and uh, the first parallel co corpus for this task was pro proposed in the previous year. And uh, yeah, uh, and for uh, as for Russian, much less work has been done. Uh, has been done, and uh, uh, last year, in a first such competition was organized. It was like the first, uh, first in the in the world, not only for Russian uh, language. Um, yeah. Uh, now let's talk about the, uh, pos uh, the possible uh, methods for de desexification. The closest uh, method to uh, what we propose is para-Jedi. So in this work, uh, uh, the authors um, uh, adapt Jedi to, to textile transfer, and uh, more specifically, de desexification. The main idea is that they uh, substitute the original uh, regular language model with a language model that's capable of paraphrasing. So now let's finally talk about our method. It's called Parachive, similarly to Parajedi. And uh, the main idea is the same, that we replace the uh, regular language model with a paraphrasal language model. And we also uh, generate several candidates as common for, uh, for uh, generation tasks. And uh, at the final step, we sort the, ca the candidates uh, according to style, trans tra style transfer accuracy and semantic similarity. Um, and uh, yeah, here's the uh, algorithm for sorting. I would I will not sp uh, spend time on explaining it, but I could uh, explain it if there will be the, some questions. But the main idea here is that we try to balance style transfer accuracy and uh, and uh, semantic similarity. So uh, in our work, we experiment with both Russian and English detoxification. For Russian, we uh, the, we take the data from the uh, detoxification competition. Um, yeah, it's a parallel data set, and for, we employ the evaluation set up in this, uh, in this competition, so the uh, paraphrases are uh, assessed on three metrics, including uh, style transfer accuracy, content similarity, and language fluency. Um, yeah, and uh, as for the models that we use for Russian setup, so in our method we require, we require two uh, models, first the generative one and the second is uh, the classifier that uh, guides the, uh, the uh, generative model. So the, for the classifier we use a rubber tiny that we train on the uh, trained uh, subset of uh, the competition and for the, for the paraphraser we explore a line of generative paraphrases uh, proposed for Russian language, including GPT-based model and T5-based models. Um, for English, we use test data from the paper that proposed Parajedi, um, and we employ the same, uh, quite the same evaluation setup from the Russian language. Um, 
Yeah, so, uh, so for the mod uh, models we use a, uh, for the classifier, we use a Roberta that was trained on one million examples. It comes from the uh, paper that proposed by Jedi. And for the paraphraser, we use the uh, T5 baseline from the, uh, the same uh, uh, paper, the, the same Parajedi uh, paper. Um, yeah, so now let's proceed to the results. So here you can see um, the uh, table with Russian uh, results. So uh, first, that we, uh, we can say that uh, uh, the paragraph models are uh, uh, so yeah, this column is uh, a, a joint metric that combines all the three uh, metrics uh, uh, used for evaluation. So we can say that the, uh, uh, the uh, all uh, paraarchive models, they nearly doubled uh, the uh, joint score. And uh, we also see that uh, the T5 models are better at uh, uh, preserving the content, which is quite logic from the encoded decoder uh, architecture of the model. But we also can note that the uh, performance of uh, paraarchive models uh, remains lower than the supervised baseline, and uh, overall is uh, lower. Uh, then, yeah, the supervised uh, baseline may, mainly because of uh, uh, insufficient uh, content uh, content preservation and fluency of the outputs. However, we can see that uh, in style transfer accuracy, uh, one of the paraarchive models outperforms the supervised baseline, the supervised T5, T5 baseline that was trained uh, uh, by the organizers. Uh, just a side note that uh, none of the competi competitors have supervised the supervised uh, the uh, have surpassed the supervised baseline that was pr proposed by the organizers. So here you can see the examples of uh, the detoxification in Russian. So uh, I forgot to uh, say that there's a, an alpha parameter which is in charge of the cell strength, and the lower the parameter is, the more strong the the uh, cell transfer is. So uh, we explore. We, uh, we here we display uh, examples of min uh, of alpha equal to minus five and minus one, and so with minus one the style is stronger, and we can see that all uh, severe toxic uh, words are uh, cleared out by the model, and uh, so in the results you can see any uh, uh, severe toxic um, words, but with uh, uh, alpha uh, alpha equal to minus one, we can see that, that some toxicity remains. Um, yes, and, and some 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 uh, swear words remain uh, in the results. So now, uh, next, we uh, perform some kind of an ablation stud study uh, over uh, our model, and we compare um, just plain, plain paraphrases with uh, the paraphrases uh, with the added uh, re-ranking or sorting uh, of the candidates uh, procedure. And we can see that uh, it, just adding the re-ranking, uh, uh, it, it, it makes the joints score uh, higher. But it's not the, just that simple, because if we take a deeper look and, the, and perform a more fine-grained comparison of paraarchive and uh, just plain paraphrasing, we can see, uh, we can see um, that uh, if we um, aggregate, uh, aggregate uh, metrics uh, over uh, 10 candidates, uh, if we sample uh, uh, 10 candidates for uh, uh, every uh, sample in the test set, we can see, and, and then we aggregate the results, we can see that the, uh, the overall uh, toxicity of the uh, uh, just plain paraphraser is much, uh, much uh, higher. So this means that just using a plain paraphraser isn't enough to uh, detoxify sentences. Moreover, if we... Uh, look at some uh, thing that we really uh, we refer to as relative toxicity so here are the graphs by the o uh, x axis you can see the source toxicity of the test samples and then by the o y axis you can see the um toxicity of the resulting paraphrases um and if we draw a regression line on uh, these uh, graphs we can see that the slope coefficient of uh, the, uh, well, you probably can see it, but, but trust me, it's, it's lower that, uh, than the uh, uh, coefficient of uh, just plain paraphraser, which means that uh, the par paraarchive model uh, copes better with the task of detoxifying and uh, de detoxifying, uh, detoxifying the uh, sentences. And 
Moreover, the intercept coefficient of the regression line is higher, which means that the uh, is lower. Sorry, so this means that the overall toxicity of the uh, samples produced by Perikhov model is lower. Now let's take a look at uh, the alpha parameter. And here, unexpectedly, we can see a rise of uh, the style transfer accuracy uh, with the uh, rise of alpha parameter. So I, I'll uh, remind you that uh, the higher the alpha is, the, the less strong the style, the style transfer is. So this uh, finding needs more thorough uh, investigation. However, with uh, alpha equals, equal to minus one, we can see a predicted and uh, explainable drop of uh, uh, style transfer accuracy, and it goes even lower with uh, um, no uh, no case sampling equal to uh, just plain paraphrasing. Uh, next, we also compare the result across, uh, the results according to the entropy threshold, and here we also see an unexpected behavior because uh, with uh, the rise of uh, uh, the entropy threshold, the uh, style transfer, uh, transfer accuracy al uh, also rises. Which, however, is good because uh, the higher the entropy threshold is, the more rarely we apply the classifier. So it is uh, more efficient in, te in terms of uh, computation. And uh, for example, uh, uh, yeah, so the, the, high, the peak of uh, accuracy is achieved at uh, entropy equal to uh, 1.5. And this sampling was 1.4 times uh, faster than uh, with uh, entropy threshold equal to zero. So let's look at the, the results in the English language. Here we can see that also the um, Perikhov models are much, uh, much more, uh, much less toxic uh, than the just plain paraphraser. We can also note that the uh, Perikhov model outperforms the uh, Perijedi, uh, Perijedi uh, model in terms of cell transfer accuracy. And it, uh, it outperforms the second best baseline from uh, the Perijade paper uh, in terms of the joint score. So to conclude, we have adapted uh, an existing CTG method for textile transfer. We illustrated its, its, applicability, uh, its applicability by applying it to a, uh, to a subtask of textile transfer detoxification in two languages. And we also know that for Russian, it is the first uh, known uh, to us application of a CTG method for Russian detoxification. And uh, yeah, we can note that Parachive significantly uh, reduces the toxicity uh, of the generated paraphrases. And uh, however, Perikhov remains uh, uh, inferior to supervised approaches, mainly because insufficient content preservation and uh, fluency of the outputs. But on the, on the other hand, uh, Perikhov is more applicable because it remains, an, uh, it remains an unsupervised approach. So we do not need any parallel data to train on. So we can train the classifier for the, to guide the model on any classification data. Uh, uh, for the desired style, so we just need examples on the, of the source style and target style, and that's all. So for future work, we can say that it would be important to uh, assess uh, Perikhov with human evaluation, because previous sexual transfer uh, research has shown that automatic evaluation that we performed uh, cannot be fully, uh, fully uh, uh, replaced. Uh, sorry, that human uh, previous research has shown that. Uh, human evaluation cannot be fully uh, replaced with automatic evaluation. Um, secondly, it could be beneficial to uh, uh, add support for beam search in Perikhov because uh, to date it works with, uh, only with, uh, uh, with sampling. Um, uh, be, uh, and uh, that would be beneficial because we have uh, seen that just uh, uh, looking for uh, the, most uh, the least toxic uh, example in the uh, uh, plain paraphraser could could be could be quite good, but uh, uh, yeah. And so, so uh, assessing longer candidates with beam search could be uh, more uh, promising, uh, and also uh, more promising in terms of computational complexity uh, as to uh, as compared to applying the paraphraser at each uh, generation sampling uh, step. And lastly, uh, we it could be interesting to add. Uh, uh, support for two classifiers uh, for the Kaif model, so it would uh, benefit first the Kaif itself, because we could, uh, um, uh, uh, for example, 
uh, control for uh, two, uh, uh, two uh, styles at the same time. And it also could benefit uh, uh, a pair archive model because we could uh, assess uh, the um, content preservation, for example, just during, uh, uh, during the generation and not after, uh, not after it. So yeah, uh, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thanks for a very interesting talk. Uh, first of all, I just would like to ask, uh, so let's say you want to do this de detoxification in Armenian, so you don't have parallel corpus, but you have parallel corpus for uh, maybe Russian or English. Could you adapt your approach to this uh, cross or multilingual setting? Would it be hard to do? Uh, well, thank you for the question. Yeah, so uh, basically, basically we, uh, uh, first, that I can say that, of course, it would be better to have a, uh, a, a corpus in the in the uh, target language. Uh, but, however, the, the models have uh, the multilingual models have shown the uh, possibility of uh, like working with uh, like a few shot or zero shot uh, working with uh, the uh, with new languages. Um, also, we could, uh, for example, uh, take a look at so automatic translation of the corpus. Uh, yeah, so. Okay, uh, so uh, we are going to actually organize a follow-up task on this for multilingual uh, detoxification at CLE next year. So in case you would like to test some of these ideas, uh, you're welcome. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker again. Mm -hmm. The topic of our work is controllable storage generation based on perplexity minimization. Natural language generation is a field of computational linguistics that deals with the construction of computer systems which can generate understandable texts in English or other languages. Natural language generation technologies has a wide range of applications, including dialogue and question answering systems, story generation, product description generation, and some others. Making text generation controllable is an important fundamental issue in natural language generation. Controllable text generation, or CTG, is the task of generating a natural language text that meets certain control constraints set by human, such as topic, sentiment, keywords, and so on. Uh, there are two types of CTG, soft and hard. The aim of soft CTG is to provide the desired sentiment, or topic of the generated text. Hard CTG requires ensuring that the text contains explicit constraints, for example, certain keywords. In the work, we solved the hard CTG problem. The table on the slide show an example of site generation. The first row on the table gives the storyline consisting of plot phrases. The second row gives the generated text containing the plot phrases in the order they appear in the storyline. The problem statement is formulated as follows. Given a vocabulary V and sequence of prompt X, which contains car tokens of the prompt, the goal of controllable text generation is to generate a target text Y which respect to a control element C by maximizing the conditional probability P. The control element C can be sentiment, keyword, uh, and so on. Controllable text uh, generation methods can be classified into four categories, fine-tuning, 
prompt engineering, retraining or refactoring, and post-processing. Our method belongs to the post-processing category. It has following advantages. No need to create a training corpus, no need to perform a training procedure, which is difficult, expensive, and time-consuming. The goals of our work are development of a plug-and-play CTG method, which allows generating stories in accordance with the user-specified sequence of guide phrases that make up the plot of the stories. Conducting experiments on controllable generation of stories in Russian using root GPT-3 large rural packer and Sega models. From a text corpus containing stories with extracted storylines. Uh, evaluating the quality of generated texts using automatic and human-centric evaluation methods. The idea of our method is as follows. First, we generate several random short token sequences from the prompt to the guide phrase. Then we estimate the probability of following the guide phrase after each generated subsequence. Finally, we choose the most probable subsequence. We will describe the principle of our method using the example presented on the slide. The blue color uh, indicates token generated by some generation step I. Orange color indicates the guide phrase to which we want to provide a coherent transition. At every step of the generation process, we generate several random token sequences of some fixed length, for example, three tokens long. Examples of such tokens are marked in red on the slide. Then we evaluate the probability of following the guide phrase after each sequence and select the sequence with the highest probability. At the next step, we repeat the process for generating and selecting sequences of tokens. The method can be applied to any autoregressive language model for which the probability of a token sequence is decomposed using the chain rule. The task of generation is to decode the sequences of tokens from the distribution P. Important component in the generation process is the decoding algorithm. Examples of such algorithms are top K sampling and nucleus sampling. We consider a token sequence X. Uh, where x with index from 1 to i minus 1 is a prompt. x with index i to i plus k is a connecting sequence, and t is a guide phrase. Theoretically, it is possible to find the connecting sequence x with index from y to i plus k using exhaustive search of tokens from the model vocabulary. However, such search has an exponential dependence on the length of the connecting sequence and is not applicable in practice. Therefore, in order to reduce the number of variants, we propose a heuristic technique for generating and evaluating connecting sequences. First, as continuation of the prompt, um, are different token sequences of length k plus 1 are generating using some decoding strategy. Next, for each of the subsequence x, uh, this index from i to i plus q of the r sequences, the probability of following the guide phrase t after it is determined as, uh, has, as the product of the probabilities of following the guide phrase tokens. Further, at the current generation step, a subsequence is selected for which the probability is maximum. And the subsequences of length k plus 1 
um, are repeatedly generated. We want to fulfill the condition of the explicit presence of the guide phrase in the text. It after the completion of the generation, the guide phrase is not inserted uh, in the text. We insert it by force. Its position is determined by the maximum probability for the entire generation. After the phrase is inserted, the generation continues towards the next guide phrase. To conduct experiments, a text corpus was formed from fairy tales in Russian with extracted storylines. The corpus is made up of fairy tales placed uh, on the site Nukadeti.ru with a length of no more than 5,000 characters. In total, the training corpus contains 562 fairy tales. In each fairy tale, plot phrases were extracted using is fr phrases that determine the main event in the story, the storyline. Uh, to do this, first in each fairy tale, keywords and phrases were selected using yak and uh, root term extract method. Uh, the plot phrase was determined by a syntactically related four element set uh, where V is a verb, O are uh, objects related to the verb M is a modifier, uh, prepositional object or indirect object. The objects uh, and modifier were selected from a set of uh, the extracted keywords. Uh, the verbs were determined from the parse tree. For example, in the phrase uh, dragon holds princess in a cave, Holds is a verb, dragon and princess are objects, and Kate is modifier. The minimum number of phrases in the plot is one. The maximum is logarithm of n base two, where n is uh, the number of um, sentences in the text. Table on the slide shows the distribution of the number of phrases in the plot in the training and test corpus. The number of plot phrases varies from 1 to 8. We used 25 storylines from the test corpus and generated two samples per storyline. Storylines contained from 1 to 7 plot phrases. In the experiments, we used uh, RUE GPT-3 large, RUE Alpaca, and SEGA models. The quality of the generated text was evaluated using automatic and human-centric evaluation methods. Four measures were used for automatic evaluation, perplexity, repetition, self blur 5 and word inclusion coverage. Perplexity is calculated and as exponential average of the negative logarithmic probability per token in the language model. A separate root GPT-3 medium model was used to compute the perplexity. Repetition score calculates the proportion of repeated four grams in the text. Cell below 5 evaluates the syntactic diversity on, of a given set of text. It is defined as the average overlap between all generated texts. Word inclusion coverage shows the percentage of plot words in, included in the generated text. Three measures was used for human-centric evaluation, coherence, relevance, uh, and interestingness. Coherence shows whether the story is consistent in terms of causal relationships in the context. Relevant shows whether the story corresponds to the plot as the events in the story unfold in accordance with the storyline. 
Interestingness shows how the user like the story, whether it is interesting. The proposed method was compared with three methods of controllable text generation, constraint beam search, few short learning, and prompt engineering. Prompts for these methods are shown on the slide. The table on the slide shows the statistical characteristics of the generated text. The few short method with RootGPT3 model on average generated fairy tales uh, three times shorter than the other three methods. It should be noted that when generating longer tales, the first tale was often interrupted and a new tale began. Similarly, prompt engineering method with Sega model on average generated fairy tales two times shorter. Sega model was trained as a chatbot. That's why when we asked this model the composed a tale, it generated short but complete tales. They corresponded well to the given plot. Automatic and human-centric quality scores are presented in the table. The values of the word inclusion coverage show that our method ensures that more than 93% of the words from the storyline event appear in the text. The text generated by our method met the requirement of matching the storyline to the best extent. Analysis of perplexity values shows us to conclude that our method shows almost the largest value of perplexity. A low perplexity value makes the generated text look more natural. The increase in perplexity indicates that the control process is unnatural for the model. The causes the model uh, to be more surprised by the tokens observed in the text. The self blur value shows that our method with the Sega model allowed us to obtain the most diverse text among all methods. To calculate human-centric measures, the generated texts were evaluated by three annotators for coherence, relevance, and interestingness. The assessment was carried out on a five-point Likert scale. According to the annotators, the proposed method allowed us to generate text that were most relevant to the storyline. Our method performed best when using the relative, relatively small root GPT-3 model receiving a highest score on all three human evaluation measures. Also, RUGPT3 model generated less uh, coherent and interesting, uh, interesting text than Ru Alpaca and Sega. The table on the slide shows an example of fairy tale generated by our method using RUGPT3 model. Storyline consists of four plot phrases. All four plot phrases appear in the generated text. The garden phrases are in position with the lowest perplexity value, which seems quite logical. Experiments show that our method um, in, induces the model to shift the content of the text towards the plot phrase. Several examples of the generated fairy tales are shown on the slides. We obtained the following results in our work. We developed the method that allows generating stories in accordance with a user-specified sequence of guide phrases that make up the plot of the story. The um, we formed the text, the corpus containing stories with extracted storylines. We conducted the experiments on controlled fairy tales uh, generated in Russian. 
we calculated the values of the automatic and human-centric quality measures of the generated texts. The proposed methods uh, performed best with the root GPT-3 model receiving the highest human scores among other methods. Uh, for the larger models, it can be used as a com complement to other methods to increase the relevance of text to a given storyline. Thanks for attention. For the nice presentation and perfect timing, we have time for one or two questions. Any questions here? Thank you for the great talk. Uh, I actually have a couple of small questions about evaluation. I wonder, did you have any measures uh, whether the model generated something irrelevant, something extra? Was there something of the like? I mean, I, I, I couldn't like get it from the 14th slide. 14th slide. Like maybe some mm, super irrelevant text or uh, or you would allow that for the model because it naturally invents something. Mm. Repeat, please. OK. I wonder if it is at all important for the task whether uh, the model invents something really irrelevant to the plot. Some plot twists that's just impossible or something like that. Some... Mm. Mm. Our text uh, were relevant to the storylines. Okay. I also have another question about that, uh, how, uh, about a different metric on the next slide, on, on this slide. How did you uh, measure the coherence exactly? That is, the uh, causal relationships. What were uh, the annotators, uh, I don't know, placing some scores or tagging something? We use five-point Likert scale from one to five mark. One is uh, bad, uh, five is the good. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you for the question. Let's thank the speaker again for the good talk. Hello everyone, my name is Polina and uh, I will present a paper about using taxonomic information for hyponymic prediction using uh, large language models. So I will start with the definition of taxonomy and taxonomy is a particular case of knowledge graph. It is tree structured lexical database uh, based on easy relations and every node in the taxonomy is a set of words with a similar meanings. So, and also for every node in the taxonomy, it is true that all its child nodes are its hypernyms and all its parent nodes are its hypernyms. Taxonomy is applied for a wide range of uh, natural language processing tasks. So there is need to constantly update uh, existing taxonomies since language uh, change rapidly. Uh, however, manual extension of taxonomies uh, seems to be infeasible since it requires a lot of human labor and deep knowledge in the specific domains. Uh, so there is a large amount of uh, approach to automatize this process. However, most of them are based on uh, measuring the distance between non-contextualized embeddings that lead us to the two problems. And the first one is the fact that we need uh, direct access to the large text corpora or large set of pre-encoded embeddings to capture really uh, rare words. And the second one, even more important, is uh, the fact that uh, static embeddings do not allow us to resolve homonymy problem. So we cannot see the difference between uh, similar words with different meanings. Uh, however, both of these problems uh, can be resolved with the using of uh, large language models. 
And there are several researchers uh, exploring birds' uh, acquisition of ESA relations. And all of them show that uh, bird is able to predict uh, hypernyms and hypernyms on a quite decent level. And as for the approach presented in these uh, studies, first one is the prompting, uh, where we expect from bird to predict hypernym or hypernym in place of uh, mask token. And the second one, uh, extending, uh, also include providing bird with information about uh, taxonomy structure with uh, projecting graph embeddings into the world, into the bird space. However, there is no such uh, researchers for the decoder-based models. So in the current study, we propose to formulate task of taxonomy enrichment as a task of conditional generation and apply decoder-based models uh, to predict the child nodes for the target node. And also inspired by very high performance of decoder-based model uh, in solving uh, zero-shot uh, text generation task, uh, we also aim to uh, try to formulate such textual input that will also provide uh, information about taxonomy structure to the model. And there is also some additional parameters which sort in the taxonomy, not only the graph structure, uh, and also additional information such as definitions or sense numbers. And for the first part of our research, uh, we'll try to find the best form of, uh, of input data uh, to provide the model information uh, for taxonomy enrichment task. And for the second part of this research, uh, we will fine tune uh, decoder based language models uh, and try to predict hyponyms. Uh, so usually when we speak about uh, condition generation, we use some natural input prompts or direct instructions. Uh, however, natural language input uh, isn't very suitable for our task, since we need to predict uh, hypernames for very large amount of different terms. So it's quite impossible to formulate a really universal prompt. For example, if we'll speak about the simplest uh, possible natural prompt, like X is a something, we will also face the problem that even the choice of article highly impact uh, the expected outcomes. And also when we will speak about some more extended uh, parents that also marks is a relations, we also can get some inappropriate statements. For example, my favorite retinopathy is di diabetic retinopathy uh, makes no sense since retinopathy is a disease. And the second problem with the natural prompts is the fact that we are still not able to resolve the homonymy. For example, we need uh, to specify handwritten context also to define uh, which meaning is here presented. So in order to overcome these hindrances, we propose to create some artificial input. Uh, the main idea behind it is to linearize a graph structure and, uh, um, and mention in the input uh, hierarchical structure in the flat form. Like we will mention uh, grandparent, uh, parent, uh, and target nodes uh, in the order, and expect that the model will understand the pattern and then predict uh, the child nodes for the target synset. Uh, the also advantages of this approach is that we can embed information from the taxonomy automatically for any target node. So there is three main uh, nodes features that included in the word name data, which we use in our experiments. So the first one is the uh, definitions for the terms uh, in the each node. The second one is the lemmas, which is synonyms to the title of the node. And the third one is sense numbers that uh, mark uh, order of the particular sense of the word. For example, uh, bed as wooden club and bed as animal would have different sense numbers. 
So based on these parameters, we create eight uh, formats of artificial input, and you can see some of them uh, in the slide. So first one is uh, the, sh the shortest. Uh, it only contains mention of parent of a target node. And the basic one also contains uh, mention of grant parent nodes. And the most extended contains all possible information that we can get from the taxonomy. And so then we use this eight, pro eight uh, artificial input forms to fine tune GPT-2 and T5 base uh, models. To evaluate our experiments, uh, we used two data sets for each uh, language. One of them is bigger and uh, consists of 1,000 randomly selected preterminal WordNet nodes. Uh, this data set is very suitable to evaluate in taxonomy enrichment tasks since it resembles uh, real data of this task. However, it not allow us to assess, um, to evaluate uh, hyponymia creation acquisition from the decoder-based models, since uh, this data set contain, uh, contains uh, very rare and specific terms, which uh, might be not represented enough in the training data. So to overcome these problems, we also created two manual data sets, which consists from some very easy and frequent terms, for example, like uh, beverage or cheese. And also how we can calculate our metrics uh, for each uh, sample from the data, we generate uh, 50 sequences using top case sampling. And then we separate outputs by the comma and sort them by the frequency. So we believe that this approach uh, is more robust and reliable than the greedy search one. Here you can see the content of English and Russian manual datasets. Uh, we try to find uh, matching terms from the both uh, WordNets. However, it is uh, not really possible due to different uh, graph structures. So here you can also see some replacements. Uh, as for here, you can see the results of the selection of best form of uh, artificial prefix. Uh, so uh, surprisingly, we can see that the most full and extended in terms of information uh, input format uh, shows the lowest results. We connected to the two factors. Uh, the first one is uh, simple the reducing of the correct answers that model can see, since we make a uh, prefix longer and the model can see less uh, amount of correct examples. And the second one, uh, we assume that a uh, large amount of unstructured information, such as definitions, uh, can lead that it becomes very hard to model to capture the main information. And as for comparison uh, of the models, we can also see that uh, GPT-5 or GPT-2 uh, shows uh, greater recall scores, while T5 is leading by the precision. And also, we can observe from precision at 10 scores that GPT is uh, more sensitive to the input format comparing with T5. So, for the next stage of our experiments, we use default uh, input format with sense numbers for English and uh, default format for Russian since Russian WordNet uh, do not have uh, such sense numbers and used to fine tune three models for each language. Uh, first model is a decoder, second one is encoder decoder and the third one is instruction tuned decoder of larger size. So here you can see the results for easy manual data sets for both languages. And we can see that uh, for both languages, uh, instruction tuned models uh, outperform the other with a large margin. And as for models uh, comparison, uh, we get controversial results and we can say which one decoder or encoder decoder suits our task better since 
uh, GPT-2 is better for Russian data and T5 is better for English data. And here is the results for uh, big random data set. Uh, and we can see that scores are pretty low in comparison with previous slide, since this uh, data is really hard, uh, both for human and for models. So the scores are low. And we also can see that uh, even that in English, uh, Dolly still outperforms the smaller models, but uh, for the Russian, uh, Sega shows lower scores than the GPT, and we connect this to the fact that uh, base model for Sega is Llama, so Sega can see much uh, less uh, lexical diversity than GPT-2. Here you can see some results of the prediction for the English uh, for GPT and T5 large. And here is uh, results for the target nodes, which show the best uh, scores in terms of precision. So to sum up, uh, we can, uh, we found out that Decoder-based models shows a uh, really high level of uh, acquisition is a relationship, and also that um, the most useful information from the taxonomy uh, is uh, pointing on the highest level of the taxonomy, such as mention of grandparent node is much more important than the definition to help the model to resolve the homonymy and predict correct answers. Uh, however, despite high results uh, for the main node data set, uh, low scores on the hard one data set uh, shows uh, the further need for investigation in this direction. And as for future work, we think that uh, maybe prompt tuning of large models can uh, improve our results. And also we expect that our approach uh, could be extended both for the other languages and other taxonomy enrichment tasks, not only hyponymy prediction. So thank you for your attention. I'm ready to answer questions. First, thank you for the talk. And I wanted to ask, how do the errors of the models look like? So uh, do the models produce like very specific words or they, are they like on, not on the topic? Or like, are they for, like similar to the word that we are trying to look uh, hyperonyms for, or just something irrelevant? Uh, no, there is no like really ir irrelevant results. But we face the problem that, for example, uh, formulation of terms is in taxonomy is very specific. For example, as a human, we expect uh, for the beverage the word water. However, there's no water in the taxonomy. There is only drinking water, so we can get lower scores uh, because of this fact. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and the metric is for exact match of the word, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe um, there's some room for uh, like uh, uh, exploring the, the metric, like uh, semantic similarity. Uh, yeah, and, and not exact match would be nice and also maybe we will perform some human evaluation mm -hmm. thank you thank you thank you for the talk uh, so uh, the prompting approach uh, works almost in all the cases but not in all cases uh, can you comment like what uh, might be the reason why this degrades performance in some for some of the models uh, we do not really use the prompting approach since we use artificial input and the model can like uh, only for pre-training information understands what do we want uh, so we use artificial input and also for artificial for artificial input we have uh, much difference in scores uh, between the models. Uh, and I think that's really connected with uh, like amount of information that model uh, seen during the training. So the harder, 
the larger model uh, seems to be tend uh, to perform better. So, so they don't need this input or output post processing uh, larger models. No, they they all need. Uh, since we use fine tuning, all the models uh, learn correctly as expected format and produce uh, terms uh, separated by a comma. So we do not need uh, too much processing. We only need to split and sort. Any more questions? I have uh, one question. So, if to sum up, you compare two large models and the huge model with six billions of parameters. Can you say yes. something about uh, how size of a model is actually matters because the large is less than one billion and six is much bigger? Mm -hmm. if correctly. I think that size difference is really matter for the hard one data set uh, since uh, like for the bigger data set bigger data set the difference between a smaller models and uh, dolly is like twice uh, in this course and as for a smaller data set we do not observe such a huge difference in the course between smaller and larger models. Okay, let's thank the speaker. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here today. And today I'm going to present our joint research static dynamic or con contextualized uh, on the explanation of discovering sh semantic shift approaches and basically uh, today I'm more like a presenter because the main contributor is Veronika Niganova who is here with us today uh, on Zoom and after my talk she will be also glad to answer uh, the questions with me and once again uh, the research is mostly hers and I'm more like a mentor and a presenter today because unfortunately Veronika was unable to come here today offline. So, uh, as for the plan for this talk, first we will talk about the goal and the motivation of the research and then uh, briefly walk through the related work and the data sets. Then we will discuss the models we are going to explore throughout this work and the experimental setup. And then uh, we will look at the results, uh, understand the applicability of the uh, studied approach and discover the words uh, which experienced uh, uh, the most uh, significant semantic shifts at this point. Uh, thus, and of course, we will talk about the future work and the possible development of the research. Uh, so, uh, in this work, we focus on semantic shift changes, in other words, on changes in word meaning uh, that are analyzed by studying the context in which, in particular, word is used in different time slices. Uh, studying diachronic semantic shifts is important for both theoretical and practical reasons. On the one hand, uh, hand it helps researcher uh, to um, in historical linguistics to understand uh, the, how the word meaning evolve across different uh, time period and provides linguists with some uh, data-driven uh, evidence for updating and improving dictionaries. In practical terms, such models can be applied in natural language processing tasks, such as information retrieval, uh, sentiment analysis, and machine translation, for example, uh, helping to improve accuracy and the relevance of these systems, especially with historical text or multilingual data. Uh, well, uh, the main goal of this research is to discover semantic shifts in the uh, selected data set which deal with uh, media data and compare the performance of different approaches, namely here in this work we compare the three uh, main approaches, static presented uh, by work to work dynamic, uh, 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 we use dynamic word embeddings and contextualized uh, we use BERT for this task. Uh, 
We apply this model to two tasks, uh, discovering semantic shifts and uh, detecting known shifts. These tasks are quite similar, however, we just pose the question, the problem in a slightly different angle and study it under the slightly different angle. Uh, well, now let us briefly talk about the uh, most important research in this field. Uh, the first work is Diachronic Word Embeddings Reveal Static Laws of Semantic Change, uh, where the authors use three uh, different algorithms, namely PPMI, SVD on top of PMI and word vec of this gram negative sampling uh, to compare the results. In the second paper, the model is trained on all the time periods simultaneously, uh, and it's also proposed joint optimization problem that comprises both embedding learn learning and alignment problems. In the, first in the third paper, the authors apply contextualized models, which provide a separate word embedding for each occurrence of the word depending on the context two semantic shifts problem, namely an elbow and bird models. It is also interesting for us since it is dedicated to the Russian language. Uh, and the fourth paper uh, provides us with the data set and the baseline results for the semantic uh, shift detection task. So, as I've already mentioned here in our work, we use the uh, two uh, datasets, namely uh, the news corpus and social media corpus. For the news co corpus, we used already collected data from Lentaru uh, from the uh, time period which starts at the year 2000 till uh, 2019. And as for the social media corpus, it was collected uh, precisely as a part uh, of this research uh, from of contacted social networks. Namely, we collected posts from the year 2007 up to the year 2019. And we use uh, these data sets in order to identify social, cultural and political t shifts rather than linguistic semantic shifts. First, because a time period is too small for considerable linguistic changes, and second, because the nature of news and social media implies reflecting cultural and political events and processes. Well, as was already mentioned, we used uh, three uh, different approaches. Uh, the first one is the static. Uh, we use uh, the, the most classic model, uh, uh, the word to vec model with skip gram negative sampling. Uh, then uh, we use dynamic word embeddings based on the PPMI matrix. And finally, the contextualized approach uh, for which we use the BERT model. Namely, we use the uh, classic rubert based uh, model from uh, Sberbank AI. Uh, we conduct the two types of the experiments. We call the first type is discovering semantic shift task, and the second is the classification task on detecting known shift. Uh, basically, in uh, the first task, we aim at revealing semantic changes from the data, and in the second task, uh, we already give uh, we are already given la the label dataset, and the task is uh, in the form of binary classification to predict whether the word has experienced the semantic shift or not. Uh, for discovering semantic shifts, we use the following pipeline. First, we train or fine-tune the embedding models on our data for different time periods. And then we align the embeddings and reduce them to the uh, 2019 vector space for the work to vec And calculate the cosine similarity measure for each on the eligible work. For word embeddings uh, of the year 20, uh, 2000 uh, and 2019. Uh, for BERT, we use the prototype embeddings, uh, namely, we average the embeddings of all the occurrence of the words in the appropriate year. And finally, we obtain top 20 words with the lowest cosine similarity between these time periods and analyze the revealed semantic shifts of term of their validity and actuality by finding uh, the closest neighbors. 
Uh, as for the second task, namely uh, the binary classification task for detecting known shifts, we take the embedding model from the previous task, retrain them if necessary, and calculate the cosine similarity measure for each of the words in the classification list. Then uh, we train a random forest classifier, which is the classic uh, classifier, and uh, use our cosine similarity measure, um, measure at the obtained uh, feature and evaluate model with uh, the uh, quality matrix, namely we use F1 as the main matrix and also compute such matrix as precision, recall and uh, accuracy scores. Now uh, let us proceed to the results. Uh, we will start with the discovering semantic shift tasks in the new corpus. Here we see uh, the results, uh, namely the top 20 words with the lowest cosine similarity measures between the studied years, and uh, many that means that the were, they were, these words have experienced the most significant semantic shift. Ah, well, let us take a look at the most interesting example. For the word to work model, uh, we, uh, there are words like Naryat and video. Uh, in the beginning of the uh, 21st century, Naryat was associated with the police, <laughs> polizeyski Naryat, <laughs> if I could say so. Uh, while in the year 2019, uh, it is uh, this word used as an, uh, to, uh, symbolize an outfit like Narat, some uh, a beautiful dress or something. Uh, there is also an interesting change in the word video. Uh, while in the beginning of the uh, 21st century, uh, it was uh, more like a TV commercial. Uh, then it shifted to the video clip, which uh, symbolizes, which signifies the development of the smartphones and the growing popularities of things like YouTube videos and reels and so on and so forth. As for the dynamic uh, word embedding model, uh, the word Platno in uh, the year 2000 meant the railway road, and in 2019 it is referred to a painting. Uh, as for BERT, uh, we, uh, uh, BERT also captured the same technological change as the word VEC uh, with a different word CADER. Uh, this word was used in reference to staff and personnel in the year 2000, while in uh, 2019, uh, with the advance of modern technologies and mobile phones, it, it is used uh, to symbolize uh, a photo. Uh, so, so on this slide you can see the uh, visualization and we uh, actually see that, uh, for example, the word Kader has shifted a lot and here the Polotno and Narat. Uh, as for the uh, social media corpus, namely uh, the analysis of the contact posts, it, in my opinion it is even more interesting. Uh, here we see uh, for word to work the word norma and the word OO. And this is really uh, great because in the uh, beginning of the period, norm, norma or norm um, meant like good, okay, it's okay, it's norm, normal norm. <laughs> uh, while in the end of the time period, it was used in a connotation with the legal form OO. And as for the letters O, 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 in the beginning it was like O, the exclamation, uh, more like uh, an interjection, while in 2019 it, it is usually referred to the company, like общество с ограниченной ответственностью. Oh, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't translate this on the spot, but I hope that you understand <laughs> what O for the company means. So, and we can suggest that uh, this change is due to the fact that the audience uh, of Kontakti uh, grows. Uh, in the beginning of time periods, it was mostly about uh, school students, uh, while in the end, now Kontakti is more for adults, is mostly used for adults. 
Uh, the uh, same could be noticed for the, uh, the dynamic word embedding model. Uh, the word Franzuski uh, at first uh, was used in connection with this Franzuski subject, Franzuski lesson, while in the end it is as, as associated with other languages. And is, uh, as for BERT, we can highlight the word Polarny, here it is. Uh, in the year 2007, it was used in the meaning of alternative, and in 2019, it was the it is used to refer to the polar, like uh, North Polar, and so on. Well, once again, on this slide, you can see the visualization of the semantic shift for the words that was discussed on the previous slide. So, uh, this table shows precision scores for all the modern uh, models for discovering tasks, and we can see that the BERT model showed the best performance. Uh, on the second table shows the results in F1 score and other metrics obtained for the classification task. Uh, once again, we ha uh, here for the second task, we had a binary classification data set, uh, and uh, we used our embedding models as a feature for the random forest classifier to solve these uh, binary classification tasks. And we see that our models show approximately equal performance with uh, word to work giving the best result. And it should be noted that since our training corpus is smaller than the one used in the baseline research, we cannot compare the results directed with the ones from the original research. Um, but we can know that our, our F1 score indicators are close to the baseline scores. Uh, so, uh, what takeaways can we uh, <laughs> take from this research? Basically, work to vec model is a comparatively simply, simple but rather effective model. And the major problem with uh, this approach is that uh, there, we need to align word embeddings. Uh, dynamic approach uh, solves this problem by optimizing and uh, aligning the embeddings at the same time during training. But this approach is sensitive to the hyperparameters choice and is rather memory consuming. Uh, the BERT model uh, provides us with contextualized word representations, which automatically solves the alignment problem. However, in our research, we have seen that BERT model showed slightly poorer performance. Uh, and one of the possible reasons for it uh, is that um, uh, BERT uh, um, shows uh, poor results in uh, comparison with work to work model is and uh, uh, it's not uh, very good in detecting semantic shift for polysemy words. Uh, well, uh, uh, in this work, we uh, presented a new social media corpus, compared different approaches, namely the static, dynamic, and the contextualized one, to semantic shift discovering and detection tasks, and conducted an interesting discovering semantic shift analysis. In the experiments, uh, the tested model uh, revealed political, cultural, social, and technological changes in the Russian language, with the BERT uh, model showing better quality of 80% for the news corpus and 60% for the social media corpus. Uh, while analyzing and discovering uh, semantic changes for the social media corpus, we suggested that some shifts can be connected with the fact that a large part of users that wrote uh, the contact post um, grew from uh, school students to the uh, to adults, and uh, there may be two main directions for the future research. Namely, we are planning to extend the uh, scope of the studied models, namely uh, to use other contextualized uh, bird-like models like Robert Large and multilingual models, and explore other data set, larger text corpuses, and use different time slices. So, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, uh, now we are ready to answer your questions and hope that uh, Veronica is here now. 
Veronica, if you're here. Yes, I'm please. here. Yeah, say something. And could we uh, please show Veronica on the screen as well? <coughs> Is it possible somehow? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so my first question was about classification task. Um, I realized it was a binary task. Uh, so did you check uh, if the sense of the word has shifted through time? Uh, yes, we did. Well, actually, it was an anti data set with uh, several words. Uh, and um, uh, we checked uh, whether the word, uh, um, well, we had uh, these uh, words, we had uh, ground truth, uh, zero and one, yes, uh, whether there was shift or uh, there wasn't. And uh, we had several uh, words with um, uh, the appropriate years. So whether the word uh, had a shift from one year uh, to another, whether there was change. And uh, so we used our embeddings to um, um, so to assess this. Uh, okay, thank you. And another question was about, um, so this uh, is an interesting matter in general, but uh, do you know where uh, this um, results can be uh, applied in production or in some uh, applications? Um, uh, well, as uh, maybe? we said uh, in the beginning, <clears throat> And there is a uh, practical uh, applicability of uh, such um, um, ta of such models. Yes, so for example, uh, for information retrieval, sentiment analysis, and machine tra translation, uh, when uh, we give the models additional information uh, about uh, different uh, um, time. Uh, um, so we give uh, different additional information about uh, the changing uh, word embeddings in time. Yes, uh, so. Uh, just uh, as um, a helper to improve the accuracy of uh, other models, for example. Um, and uh, uh, does it work? Like, does it help when you add this information to the model uh, for the task? Of, well, well <laughs> I didn't check it personally, but uh, well, it should help, yes. Uh, okay, thank you. The third question will be from Andre. Thanks, Maria and Veronica, for our very interesting talk. And I have many questions. Not sure we will have time to address uh, to address all of them. The main one is uh, about the evaluation of uh, the findings in your discover in your semantic change discovery step. So, am I right that you ask some, like you said, experts in social science or something like that? You mentioned it in the paper. Yes, yes. So, but how exactly was it done? So, you showed them these uh, top ten or top twenty most changed words and just asked. Uh, these experts, whether these words really changed? Was this the procedure? Uh, uh, so uh, we um, gave the words uh, with the closest neighbors, uh, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, five closest neighbors in each of the periods. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, the uh, decision was made uh, primarily on this information, but uh, broader context was also available if uh, there were some uh, well, uh, if uh, they wanted uh, more information, yes. Yeah, but still, you showed the experts only the words from the top of the range. Uh, yeah, as I say, so, uh, mainly yeah. the decision was uh, made on these uh, five neighbors, closest neighbors uh, from each of the periods, but uh, broader context was also available. Uh, no, no. Uh, my question is uh, did you show the experts also some, yes. maybe some, uh, some random words from the, uh, from the bottom uh, of the ranking? Yeah. Because no, it no, would be, uh, don't you think? Yeah. Because don't you think it would be more fair? Uh, because um, uh, essentially, your method, uh, uh, the evaluation method that you use, then measures only like a key, yeah, uh, that it's only the precision, but not the recall, check. right? Yes, as but as we say that it's precision. Yes, we say that we use as metric uh, precision for this task, and we understand that uh, it's uh, rather subjective. That's why uh, we added the second task, uh, which is more objective, and uh, it's more objective to relate uh, the quality of the models. The first one was more about the data to reveal uh, the. 
semantic shift from the data and to see it was more like uh, interest uh, or what uh, words uh, can reveal from these data, uh, maybe something interesting. And uh, to make it more objective, we waited, yes, to the second task. Okay, uh, thanks. And the uh, second question is about this classification task. So why did you decide to use this uh, data set from uh, FAMIN at all 2019 when we have now available uh, the data set from the root shift eval shared task, which is much more methodologically uh, because, sane uh, and... Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, it's because uh, we had um, the practically almost the same data set uh, as uh, the one the authors of um, this data set used uh, I mean, the annotated data set, yes. Uh, they also used uh, the Lentaru um, source. And uh, that's why we used, uh, because, well, uh, I think that uh, there would be uh, more missing words uh, in our data set if we used, for example, Rushift Well, yes, in our data set, because it's not really that large. And uh, here we, like, uh, could uh, do our best to compare yes the results with the baseline research okay thanks yeah it's a pity that i'm not in uh, at the conference right now i would like to discuss it uh, with you more yeah. and yeah maybe the last question uh, so the social media corpus that you released uh, it's it's very interesting and thanks uh thanks for releasing it but uh, what are the legal like the terms of use for this corpus is it uh, legally well, uh, possible to redistribute it, train models on it? Uh, we don't impose any um, conditions on using it. Of course, it's free from our part, yes. And since we don't uh, say which of the user posted uh, which post, I think uh, there are no legal concerns from the contacted uh, social network because we collected it from the free API. So I think, uh, yes, uh, this corpus can be used. But you didn't uh, get in touch with Contacte about it because in the past they were uh, uh, they no, in we the didn't. past. Uh, no. Uh, so we sometimes didn't, uh, didn't some data contact. sets were uh, removed uh, from uh, the net because of uh, because Contacte got in touch with the, the creators oh, of the data okay. sets and made them to remove uh, the data. Okay, so you didn't well, get. Well, Eva uh, okay. didn't get in touch with uh, us. Yes, so uh, but uh, we didn't violate any rules when we were data scrapping this uh, uh, corpus. So, uh, well, if they contact us, of course, so we will have to remove it. But uh, I don't think that should be a problem. All right. Okay, uh, thanks. Thank uh, thanks a lot. Speakers. And now we have the last talk of this section. So, hello again, I'm still Evgeny Arlov, and I'm going to present a paper on probing, uh, which is titled Less, and less, uh, less Than Necessary or More Than Sufficient, Validating Probing Dataset Size. So first, let's do an introduction into probing itself. So uh, we all witness uh, the success of black box language models. Um, yeah. Um, and yeah, but the success has uh, has uh, started the interest uh, into like what's inside uh, the these black box language models, and the area of probing merged. And uh, a bright example of this uh, uh, area is the data set uh, named Semtaval, which is made for one of the first uh, probing data sets for uh, for English uh, English language. Um, yeah, so, and the probing itself is uh, the task of detecting the, so to say, true language co capability of the language model. So we uh, ask uh, the model, for example, uh, uh, does it uh, understand like the, the, the notion of uh, uh, the number or uh, case, linguistic case and other things. Yeah, and diverse probing studies exist. And for example, uh, 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 exist uh, studies that which draw graphs based on on the experiments, which uh, like display the language capability of the model uh, depending on the uh, on the layers of the model. Uh, for example, with this tw uh, twelve sized uh, twelve layer sized model, we measure uh, different uh, different domains of the language according uh, uh, depending on the uh, on the layers of the model. Yeah, and this picture is from uh, from Centaval. Yeah, and diverse probing studies exist, and 
uh, there are lots of data sets for probing, but uh, the uh, probing data sets are, uh, uh, are quite uh, difficult to uh, collect because they contain real, um, uh, uh, real language data. And uh, also, like the, si the size of the, mo of the data set mat uh, matters for computational reasons, as always. So in our paper, we propose uh, a method called fraction probing, which is used to uh, determine uh, the right uh, size of the probing data sets. And it consists of two tests, uh, which we call the data sufficiency test and data redundancy test. So data sufficiency test is used for uh, existing data sets uh, to uh, to find if they could be smaller in size, and data redundancy tests uh, can be used when building new data sets to uh, find uh, the point to stop collecting uh, uh, samples. Um, yeah, so uh, the method is based on comparing probing graphs uh, uh, and their similarity, both visually and using computational metrics. Um, yeah, and th this method is based on learning curves. Uh, which I will uh, tell you more about them. Um, yeah, so speaking of the related works to this study, uh, they of course include probing. They include pro uh, they include probing data set size, although this area is quite understudied. They include sample size determination, which is uh, used for statistical experiments and uh, like is very common for uh, when, when uh, starting new experiments. They uh, the, the related works also include learning curves, which uh, initially come from psychology, but uh, are used for, uh, for example, training models. And they also uh, include the uh, progressive sampling, uh, which is uh, uh, quite close to sample size determination, but is uh, uh, used when we are building uh, the sample uh, and, uh, and we continue to uh, make experiments on that. So now let's talk more about uh, our method. So here, in the right, pic in the right picture, you can see uh, the original centaval and the uh, graph and the graphs which demonstrate the uh, uh, capability of the model. So, uh, for example, if we take uh, this blue one, it, this is tree depth, which is uh, which means that the model sh uh, has to. Uh, has to understand how deep the syntactic, uh, syntactic uh, tree of the uh, sentence is, and it displays the uh, performance on, on the mod of the model uh, depending on different uh, layers. And uh, how we interpret is is that uh, we see that like the middle layers are more capable of doing this task than the f the first one and the last one. Um, so yeah, and in this uh, in these two pictures, you can see uh, what happens if we take a little, a very little um, uh, fraction of this of the original centaval, and this is forty percent of the original centaval, and we can see that uh, at forty percent, the graphs are quite similar to what we uh, acquire when we experiment with with the full data set. So uh, the only thing is to uh, is uh, to find out how to co directly compare these graphs. So by by our eyes, we can see that this uh, this graph isn't quite uh, doesn't look quite the same th that this one, uh, but this one is quite uh, quite close. So what do we do? We measure the graph similarity. First, uh, we uh, uh, we leave uh, the possibility of uh, uh, comparing the graphs visually, but we also uh, 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 add some metrics. So we uh, suggest using three metrics and we experiment with uh, three of them. So first is per, uh, Pearson correlation. Uh, second uh, one is uh, Euclidean distance. And uh, the third one is Frechet sure distance. So we apply all these me metrics uh, first uh, to vectors uh, uh, like here, if we, can, uh, if we have uh, 10 tasks, we compare uh, vectors sized, uh, uh, 10 sized vectors. Uh, so uh, this one with this one and so on. So like the the uh, the columns, and uh, we also compare the. Uh, uh, so yeah, we we do that uh, to compare the the uh, ordering of the uh, of the graphs, uh, and uh, we also compare directly the graphs themselves. For example, this one with this one. So this is uh, uh, this goes in a twelve sized vector. 
So we expect that uh, Euclidean distance is better when comparing uh, the uh, absolute numbers of the uh, of the graphs, and Frechet distance is uh, in uh, is uh, in charge of the uh, both uh, the form of the graphs and uh, uh, and their absolute positioning, because uh, Frechet distance is used to uh, uh, compare curves and usually is usually explained uh, as uh, as, as such. So um, imagine a man walking a dog and they can uh, walk any, uh, any curve they want. They can stop, but, then, uh, the, but they cannot go back. And the Frechet distance is measured as the minimum leash size, uh, size of the, uh, between the man and the, uh, uh, the dog that can allow uh, such uh, locomotion. Um, yeah. So uh, uh, now let's proceed to uh, to the tricky stuff. Uh, like how do we uh, find out uh, whether the uh, um, graphs are similar or, or not? So for the data uh, redundancy test with the existing data set, we compare all uh, previous fractions uh, with the original 100%. Uh, uh, um, and we draw as a so-called uh, uh, learning curve. So uh, this, uh, by the O Y axis, you can see the the uh, metric uh, that that displays the distance, and we can see that uh, moving to one hundred percent, the uh, uh, the uh, metric grows smaller, which means that we are uh, we are getting close to to the original uh, original data set. But the thing is uh, to find out where to stop. And we uh, use uh, like the uh, well, some form of the elbow method. We can we say that if we stop like where uh, uh, at the beginning of the Plato, uh, we are at the right uh, at the right place. Um, yeah, so that's what we do with the, the existing data sets. We just plot. Uh, uh, we continuously plot uh, the uh, metric uh, for different factions and find out the uh, the elbow the the uh, the place where the Plato starts. But uh, the thing, uh, the things are trickier for uh, the datasets that are being built at the moment because we do not have uh, any dataset to compare with. We do not have that imaginary 100%. So we uh, uh, somehow simulate the uh, setup for the existing uh, for the existing um, uh, the existing uh, dataset. So what we do is we. Uh, uh, we think, uh, think like that. So we have an, uh, the data set that we uh, have right now. We think that it, we imagine that this is our 100% and we um, compare the, all the previous fractions with it. But, but the problem here is that we uh, like the graph continuously, well, we get like the uh, next uh, points of the graph continuously. And we, uh, if we just look at the graph, we cannot say if we have uh, already reached the plateau or not. So uh, in addition to just comp uh, uh, computing the uh, original numbers of the metrics, we also compute first and second differences of uh, the metric to say uh, like for the first difference uh, displays uh, the, the change of uh, uh, the absolute change of the metrics and the second difference um, displays the speed uh, of the change. Yeah, so uh, we propose the method and we also uh, try, uh, we also uh, display its applicability. So we work with the center valve, the most uh, famous uh, probing uh, suit. So it consists of 10 tasks of 10,000 samples each and we, uh, we uh, like uh, create these uh, fractions of it uh, continuously, um, and uh, yeah, we we perform the data redundancy test with the existing interval, and we also simulate the data data sufficiency test as if we were building uh, the uh, uh, the original interval. We experiment with Bert and Roberta, and we use logistic regression as a classifier. Um, um, yeah, so the results for uh, the uh, the uh, uh, data sufficiency, uh, data redundancy, sorry, test, you have already seen them. And you can see that for uh, uh, at 40% of the original center valve, the uh, graphs are uh, quite close uh, to what happens at 100%. Uh, um, 
Here you can see uh, the table of uh, all the results for the BERT model. So here are lots of uh, figures, but it displays both the data redundancy test and uh, the data sufficiency test. So here you can see uh, uh, the three metrics that we compute. The first one is uh, just the metric uh, themselves. Uh, sorry, um, yeah. Uh, the first one is uh, the uh, uh, the metric themselves. Uh, so yeah, the, the, uh, these figures are the uh, fractions of, of the original data set that are so, uh, so to say recommended by the uh, uh, metric. Uh, so you can see from this table that uh, the interval data set could be uh, actually could be uh, massively reduced, although the uh, the uh, uh, the actual uh, numbers differ for different uh, tasks. So here we can uh, here are uh, some uh, conclusions about the uh, uh, this this big table. So the visual method uh, shows that each task could be reduced without lo uh, losing its uh, its like explanatory power. Um, the uh, 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 the tasks differ by their uh, uh, how they look like when uh, um, uh, when uh, uh, increasing the, their size. So, uh, for example, word content here, you can see that the absolute name, uh, absolute uh, uh, numbers of it of, of its curve are, are rapidly changing throughout the different fractions. However, uh, other uh, other types of uh, 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 of uh, tasks doesn't show uh, don't show such behavior, so we call this score growth. So there's a group of score growth tasks, and uh, are, there are tasks with no score growth. So when applying the uh, metrics uh, in a task-wise manner, uh, we can we conclude that Frisch distance uh, shows the least uh, the lowest mean error. Uh, and per, uh, Pearson correlation doesn't uh, really uh, uh, look at the absolute number uh, absolute numbers of the uh, uh, of the curves. So if we want to compare only the uh, uh, the shape and the uh, if the absolute numbers aren't really relevant for us, then we can use Pearson correlation. So for layer layer wise uh, method uh, of application the, of the metrics, we can see that. Uh, in general, order, uh, uh, preserving the ordering of the curves requires more data than uh, preserving the shape. For the data sufficiency test, we see that, uh, simulated with the SEMTOVAL, we can see that uh, the discrete difference, uh, differences co constantly, constantly recommend higher fractions, so, so they are, uh, in a way, uh, more strict than the original metrics. Um, yeah, but however, they are highly, highly correlated with the original metrics. So, uh, yeah, the the, uh, uh, the results of the data sufficiency test simulated on Centerval some, uh, resemble the results of, of the data redundancy test on the actual Centerval. Um, yeah, and uh, another thing is that the second uh, difference uh, difference produces less error than the first one. Uh, which uh, uh, which can be explained by the fact that the, it is uh, less strict and looks at the speed of the change, not at the change uh, itself. Yeah, so uh, uh, I uh, showed already showed you this graph. Um, yeah, and uh, looking at particular uh, different linguistic uh, uh, central tasks, we can divide them into two groups. First, that we uh, can reduce to the minimal fraction of 10% uh, for both BERT and Roberta. And second, which, requ uh, the, uh, uh, which require more data. Um, interesting is that uh, this uh, division cannot be really explained by the uh, linguistic uh, content, linguistic sense of the tasks, so this needs more thorough investigation. Um, yeah, but the thing that we can uh, already note that the like standard classification parameters remain relevant. So the word content task that you uh, see here is different from all the other tasks because it has a massive number of, of classes. It is 1000 uh, as compared to other tasks which have like two or three classes. Yeah, uh, we experiment with two modules so we can compare uh, between them. And we uh, note that Roberta constantly requires more data, 
uh, well, the, the, there could be different explanations to this fact. We uh, go with the explanation that uh, Roberta has, like, it, it is more, uh, it's more, uh, uh, it's, uh, was based on BERT, and uh, the, uh, and uh, it was more developed uh, on the base of it, and therefore it has, like, more, uh, uh, more uh, quality, high quality data encoded in it, and therefore it, uh, they, it needs more uh, probing data to uh, to uh, find out what's inside. And Roberta uh, 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 similarly uh, needs more data to preserve the ordering of the tasks. Uh, yeah, so th these numbers are higher for Roberta than Bert. Um, yeah, so to conclude, we propose a novel method for uh, determining the right si uh, size of the probing data set. Uh, it consists of two, uh, two tests, which uh, first one, uh, of which first one is data redundancy test, which is applied to existing data sets to find out uh, if they are actually bigger than, than they uh, could be. And the data sufficiency test, uh, it, it is applied to uh, data, set that, uh, data sets that are being uh, built at the moment. Um, yeah, and we experiment with uh, Centerval and, and apply it in both setups. So for further work, uh, it would be interesting uh, to look more deeply at the uh, uh, learning curves that we uh, work with in our method, because we call them learning curves, but they are not actual learning curves that they are usually uh, perceived by this notion. Um, they are field like uh, they are created by, so to say, artificial data, and it, it would be interesting to find out if they follow the inverse power law, which was shown uh, for uh, usual uh, learning curves. Uh, another important uh, point for future work is to uh, create a numerical definition of the Plato that we are. Uh, uh, by, by, by this time, we determine like by the visual method, and it could, in some cases, in, it's tricky to find out where the Plato is. Um, yeah, and uh, another further uh, point for further work is to apply uh, uh, the proposed methods to other uh, uh, ex uh, other ex existing probing datasets because our results imply that uh, actually uh, the existing uh, probing datasets could be smaller or even much smaller than they are at the moment. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, is your methodology for uh, estimating uh, sufficient size of datasets is generalizable to other tasks? Let's say not only probing, but other classification tasks. Uh, and uh, because I think it's uh, quite valuable for pretty much every task, right? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Yeah, actually, it is applicable. Uh, I could say that it is applicable to any uh, probing, uh, probing task that draws uh, curves. But actually, uh, like developing on your question, I can say that the method could be applied to any task that uh, produces vectors. So uh, the, the novelty of uh, the proposed method is that we can uh, we come up with the means of uh, comparing the shape and the relative positioning uh, of the of the curves. So uh, like if we compare, so uh, answering your question, yeah, the method could be applied to any task that produces vectors. Uh, which consists of, of uh, numbers. And if uh, this, uh, this task is pretty generic, uh, did you search for some alternative methods uh, which exist maybe in the literature for estimating size of data sets? Maybe not specific for probing, but just in general for machine learning. Such kind of methods, uh, I mean, exist or yeah, uh, yeah, they exist, and it, it is actually a big, like, classical area of uh, determining uh, the uh, the size for machine, uh, say, size of the data set for machine learning. But they are usually applied to uh, tasks that produce uh, either one number or just classification. And our task of comparing uh, curves are is much uh, more complex in that way. Thank you. More questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker and go thank for you. lunch. We'll come back at three. Okay, dear colleagues, I think that's time to start the session. So please take your seats. Oh.
All right, so uh, in this afternoon session, we start with, uh, uh, with uh, our second keynote talk. Uh, this talk will be given by uh, Hakim Hasid, who is a principal researcher in the Technology Innovation Institute Abu Dhabi, which is in United Arab Emirates. And he's also a honorary professor in Macquarie University in Australia. So, and uh, Hakim will be talking about uh, HAI or some movement towards HAI. And uh, well, you're welcome. Thank you, Maxim. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. So the talk of the afternoon is always complicated after the lunch. So we'll try to make it a little bit light uh, as much as we can. <clears throat> so uh, initially, I was uh, planning to talk about, uh, I'm still, will be talking about AJI, but was more sort of a classical talk where I wanted to touch base basically on the different methods, uh, strategies that we are using in the AJI. But then I thought it's, it, it's slightly too classical for that. So what I did, uh, I, I tried to gear the talk into more sort of uh, industry inspired. Uh, we have been meeting with many industrial people these last weeks and they wanted to share uh, the small experience we had uh, in relation to this AGI and generative AI models or LLMs. I hope this would be useful for uh, the different profiles we have here in the room and maybe we'll inspire and give some ideas on topics that could be eventually uh, uh, treated at the fundamental level. So just before I start, so I'm coming from the TAI. Uh, TAI is a research institute that is located in Abu Dhabi. It's uh, the research arm of the ATRC, which is the uh, Advanced Technology Research Council. Uh, TAI is composed of uh, 10 research centers that you see here, uh, going from material, autonomous robotics, biotech, space, directed energy. We are in the AI center that is in the digital science research uh, center. These days we are, we are focusing a lot on the LLMs, <coughs> large language models, uh, but we are not doing only that. We are doing other stuff related to uh, image processing, uh, theory or fundamental uh, issues with uh, Maxime who is here. Uh, we are doing some other stuff related to edge, so on and so forth. So my presentation will be organized this way. So uh, some discussion about the generative AI, edge machine learning. So two aspects, uh, one on, related to the inference on the edge. The other one is the learning on the edge on which we are trying to focus. I will give three use cases on which uh, we are working just to illustrate this uh, sort of uh, edge AI uh, stuff. And then we'll be finishing or concluding on the future of generative AI. <clears throat> So the logic behind my, my talk today is basically to bring uh, together this, uh, these big models or these big generative models, but also open uh, the doors to this edge AI, uh, hoping that I will convince some people here that the uh, having bigger and bigger models is not necessarily the right option to follow, but there are other options also <clears throat> that are there. So just for the... Uh, Generative AI that we are, uh, that is making the buzz today. So that's not new. I'm sure everybody in the room is aware of that. So the RNNs and the LSTMs that were behind the transformers probably were uh, much older than many of, 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 of the people who are uh, in the room. Uh, but then we have foreseen a lot of sort of uh, evolution these last years after the transformers. But these transformers were not the only reason. We, had, we have actually the computation power or the physical layer that became much more interesting, much more powerful, which allowed the execution or the exploitation of these models. Uh, now we see different models that we are hearing about. We have the LAMA, uh, GPT-4, and we have Falcon that is coming from the TII, uh, for example. <clears throat> So we have started in the past. Uh, well, the AI is not a new thing again. So it's, it, it's been there for a long time, I think. Uh, it, it goes together with the uh, computer science and the computing in general. Uh, but at that time, if I, if I focus like uh, starting from the end of the 80s, 
we started looking into this artificial intelligence closer and we were hoping that we could have really intelligent systems, right? But I think uh, at some point, the objective was too big for, uh, for, the, for what the systems or the equipment, the physical layer, was able to provide at that time. I think we may all remember the expert systems at that time uh, where people were promising that uh, those systems would be able to solve all the problems that we have at work in the industry. Uh, that didn't happen. That uh, fell short, I would say. And then we had this machine learning that came uh, in the mid of, uh, of the 90s, where we were focusing more on some statistical analysis <clears throat> and more simpler problem. Then we get this deep learning. Again, this deep learning was actually, I think it came at the right time because the physical layer became much more uh, interesting. Well, then we, we, we are talking nowadays about the generative AI <clears throat> that is basically an AI that is able to generate content. And this is very important to keep in mind. This AI is able to generate content, which means we cannot do, for example, some reasoning to which I will be coming uh, later. So we are here to generate some content. You have different players working, uh, playing in different domains. We will not go through them, but that's, that's, that's the combination of the uh, deep neural networks and a sort of a, a, high, <clears throat> a higher capability in terms of uh, computation. When we got into this uh, competition that we, we, we see, uh, at least from our side, we see it almost every day, the, the, who is the one who will be building the biggest model, right? So there is a huge com competition there, but well, this competition actually is, I would say is not healthy at the end of the day, right? So we are trying actually to build the biggest model thinking that the bigger we are, uh, better we, we, we should be, right? So people started actually looking into the, this problem in a different way, right? We, we have different scaling laws that came up and demonstrating that the quality of the model is not necessarily related to the size of the data that you are putting inside, but it's more related to the quality of the data that we have inside. Just to give you an example, so when we, when TAI has released the Falcon 40B, 40 billion parameters, we have been doing better than Llama, for example, right? So, and we, honestly, the architecture that we had inside was not that uh, more sophisticated than Llama. The only thing that has been done is actually to take the data and clean the data in a better way. So we have used a smaller portion of the data, but the team has cleaned it much better than the results were, uh, became actually much better than what uh, Lama was having uh, at that time. <clears throat> so we have been ranked in the different uh, leaderboards <clears throat> as first, uh, but then Lama again came with a second version, which was better. But then we, uh, we came again with the uh, Falcon 180B that is better, so we don't know where things are going, uh, but there is this sort of uh, new vision where we are saying maybe we shouldn't continue in the size, but we need to look into other things. This is justified actually not only by the researchers who are working there, but also with the industry, right? Uh, this is why I was saying in the beginning, we had a lot of meetings with different industrial partners and players who are actually complaining about this size because you can imagine if you have a model with 180 B to run it, to run the inference, that is also costly, right? So those businesses are not ready to spend that amount of money to run models. And we can add to that, those models are too generic, right? They are not necessarily specialized in the business that they want to solve. So the, 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 the equation is becoming more complicated and we need to look into other uh, options eventually. So in this slide, they tried actually to look back again and try to see if there is a parallel between what was happening in the past in the, I would say in the hardware world and what's happening today with the LLMs, right? In the hardware world, when we started in, the, in these computers, we have actually started building big big computers, right? So and at the time, the logic was also the same. If my computer is bigger, so the, it should be more performant, right? But then we find that it's, it, it's not necessarily following that logic. Then we started building smaller computers, personal computers, so on and so forth. 
and we went even to things where nowadays we have uh, phones that can compute much more than some laptops. We have the Internet of Things, we have different stuff. So I believe that this uh, generative AI will also follow a very similar trend going from bigger, uh, bigger the model is, better the quality should be, to smaller the models are, the, the quality also should be better at, or at least equivalent to what we have. So this opens actually the, the way to look into this edge and what this, uh, what this edge, basically the edge is the, 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 the edge of the network or the small devices that are there that are nowadays used mainly to capture the data and display the results instead of having any uh, sort of computation that is happening there. So, can a single model, a uh, large model, actually sort out everything? This is the question that we are asking more and more nowadays. Uh, I think the simple answer uh, is no. We are facing a lot of issues when it comes to the practical dimensions. Uh, the businesses, as I said, are not ready to uh, spend a lot of money on a general model that is not necessarily serving uh, the, the objectives of the business. I hear that we can do some uh, fine-tuning, for example. Yes, but that is also uh, costly. Uh, so people are questioning actually the use of these of these models. You have different other aspects that uh, that are related to that. I just mentioned, uh, I mean, related to the this answer of no, or that, that justify the uh, no answer. So you have the domain specificity, but then you have the data availability. As of now, all the LLMs, <clears throat> at least as of uh, three days back, all of all the LLMs are built on historical data. Uh, businesses are interested in uh, more real data, real-time data, uh, how to process that real data, how to integrate it in the LLM to be able to exploit it. Uh, you have the uh, multimodal tasks. People are not interested only in text. We see more and more multimodal uh, models that are coming, coming out, but we have still have the same issues in terms of uh, generality of the content, issues with their <coughs> fine tuning, for example, so on and so forth. The cost that is related to the uh, LLMs or these generative models. Uh, building a model is not, uh, I would say, open for everyone. For the moment, we have big players that are or who are building such models. You have, uh, I don't know, OpenAI, Google, uh, Meta. You have TII who is spending a lot uh, on that. But if we go to small companies or just uh, companies who are not in that business, uh, the cost may be extremely high and it's too risky for them. You have the issues of privacy and security. Your data actually is going in the LLM. You don't know what's happening with your data. Your competition can get access to the data, for example, without knowing anything. <clears throat> Customization, this is the things related to those who are working, for example, on the web and the recommender systems. Uh, there is no personalization that is uh, by default added to the uh, to the LLM or to the generative model. The scale and the complexity. So here again, the LLMs and the, these generative models are specialized in generating content, right? So they learn pat patterns and then they try to give back those patterns. Uh, there is no uh, reasoning that is there, as I said. And then you have issues related to the ethical and bias uh, considerations and the carbon footprint that uh, many of these actors I have mentioned before are trying to uh, sort of uh, work on, uh, but still there is a lot of, uh, lot of effort to be done uh, as of now. Just to give you an example again, to, to, to compute the uh, Falcon 180B, the, 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 the amount of computation that was used, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Maxime, I think we used 4,000 uh, GPUs for six months. Okay, so that's 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 huge, and in terms of energy, uh, that's uh, well, I think it's more than the cars that are uh, circulating outside for uh, for some period. So the generative AI uh, process, when it comes to the uh, domains, uh, and I mean the conclusion from the previous one is that we need to think of more specialized models. We need to rethink the approach. Uh, that we are taking for uh, building these models instead of building general models, big models. Maybe the idea is to look into smaller models 
uh, exploiting smaller devices. For those who are not familiar with uh, what is done in the in this generative AI, so you have sort of a, a part of the system is to get your data, be it text, image, speech, whatever you have. Then you do some uh, preparation of the data, you do your training, this is your foundation model. But then when you want to apply it for a specific domain, I don't know, energy, education, uh, finance, you need to do some fine tuning, right? Fine tuning is the adaptation of the general model into specialized uh, domain or specialized uh, task, okay? So this is, of course, costly, but this part also is less costly, but still it will cost you into things. So the adaptation itself and then the hosting uh, usually of the uh, inference. <clears throat> To go to specialized models, you have this fine tuning, but you can build also, uh, we can think of building more specialized models and more much smaller models. Uh, some sort of arguments that push us towards uh, thinking of other strategies, uh, the privacy and security uh, concern. So most of the companies and the businesses now are raising these issues of uh, security and privacy. Uh, you have even governments who are setting rules on uh, sort of uh, business data. They should not leave the country, for example. This is what we have in the UAE, for example. Your data as a business should not uh, leave the country and should be processed and stored in the country, right? Using all those services like ChatGPT uh, is against the law. So uh, no, none of the companies is using these kind of things. Uh, so, I mean, this is an argument that will come more and more uh, to sort of uh, uh, push us either, I mean, push everybody either to build their own LLM or generative model or think of smaller, uh, think of strategies that will help in building smaller models uh, in the future. So there is a high cost constraint. So everybody is complaining about the cost. Whenever you mention the cost, uh, people are not uh, prepared for that. Well. You have also the awareness, right? People, they don't understand the needed energy or the needed computation to run these kind of models, but still the costs are high and everybody is complaining about that. You have also the, some, some opportunities that are open at the edge level. The computation power is getting more and more interesting. So we can do some, some stuff at the edge level. At the edge level, you can have basically your computers, your uh, your uh, uh, your phones, for example, you can do some stuff. It's not at the same uh, sort of uh, order of magnitude as the GPUs or the clusters of GPUs, but maybe this can be exploited for, for such a thing. So the uh, higher demand and the expectation on the performance, people, they want sort of uh, less uh, latency, for example. Good, so this is the architecture, I mean, a very high level architecture of what we have as infrastructure today. So we have the cloud, then you have edge devices that are related to the cloud. As I said before, the edge devices currently are used mainly for capturing the data and displaying the results that, that you may get. So most of the techniques we have, we use these devices, we capture the data, we send it back to the cloud where things, all the computation is done. Then when we have the result, we send it back to the, uh, to, 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 for display. Well, we could look into that and that will be later my conclusion. I will link it to this one. Uh, but we believe that the edge layer is not that much, uh, I would say, used, right? So we could use that layer. <clears throat> we could use it in a better way uh, to sort out these privacy issues, to sort out these cost issues, uh, to sort out the latency issues. And this, these are the reasons that pushed us to start thinking about the, this edge. So the edge machine learning is, is basically what? It's a combination of edge uh, computing and machine learning. The objective is to build uh, uh, and execute machine learning models directly on that. Of course, we have to start from somewhere, right? We will not start by building an LLM directly on the edge. But what we are trying to do currently is to build at least traditional machine learning or some small deep learning models on the edge and then try to find ways to go a little bit uh, uh, further. So this edge machine learning is, uh, can be operated on one uh, device or multiple device. They are constrained by no sharing of the data. We don't want to share the data with the cloud, for example, or with other devices, or at least we should have control 
of that uh, sharing. And we hope that we can offer uh, similar capabilities to what you get from a cloud, uh, a cloud system. Good, some questions uh, that motivate the use of the edge. So is there a real need to share the data with the, with the cloud? Is there a need actually to let your data leave uh, uh, from your device and go somewhere else? And then how can, can we allow uh, training to happen directly on the edge? This is a very important uh, uh, issue because of the limited uh, sort of computation that you have on the edge. And how can I efficiently execute those models uh, on the edge when it comes to the to the inference. <clears throat> so we have done a paper where we have, it's, it's a long paper, I will be trying to summarize it into uh, four or five slides. Uh, we have tried to understand the different requirements of the edge machine learning. We have divided that into three parts. So the machine learning requirements, the edge computing requirements, and then you have some overall requirements that are related to everything. Uh, from, from the machine learning perspective, you have the low task latency, the high performance. We need always high performance uh, to when it comes to the computation. Generalization, we always, uh, again, we need some generalization when we find our models. Enhanced privacy and security, and then we have to be independent from the data that is uh, labeled. From the edge computing, we have the efficiency in the computation, optimized bandwidth, offline capability, and low communication. Uh, latency. This offline capability comes most of the time because the people, they may have issues with the network and they still need to use their services. Uh, that's a very important thing. Uh, and this should be allowed by the edge machine learning. And you have the cost and the energy that I would say is related to, to all. So we have to play with all these parameters when we think of uh, doing edge machine learning. Uh, it's not an unlimited resource as we have in the cloud. Uh, for example. So you have three parts when it comes to edge machine learning. You have the learning on the edge, you have the inference on the edge, and then we have some parts, some of the work that is done around the preparation of the data directly on the edge. So the paper I was referring to is this one for those who are interested. It was published a few, few weeks back. Uh, it's a long paper, it's around 50 pages, but we go through the different aspects related to uh, edge uh, machine learning. Uh, so from the inference, so I try to summarize things uh, in this slide. We have different ways of uh, applying or bringing sort of a, a big model to run on a smaller device. So the first one I believe everybody is familiar with is the quantization. We are working a lot uh, on that. So we're trying actually to uh, work on the models to change the encoding of the data, or to reduce the encoding of the data so that the model becomes uh, smaller, but still we keep the quality of the, uh, of the, of the model. Uh, we're able to quantize model up to, uh, models up to four bits uh, from 16 bits, and we keep a very similar uh, sort of performance. Uh, you have people who are working on the weight reduction. Uh, we are not sort of handling this part for the moment, but the idea here is to see it's a sort of a, a pruning strategy that we are uh, sort of exploring. We have the knowledge distillation, the activation approximation. I'm just going quickly on, on this one. Uh, well, we are not doing much on that, but on the last two ones, the early exit, we are exploring it a lot, uh, combining it with the uh, model compression, and we have the caching. Uh, when it comes to the exploitation of the uh, large language model uh, models on uh, on the web. <clears throat> so the uh, inference on the edge has a reflection. I think you have a variety of methods that are there, uh, promising results. You have uh, sort of methods that are able to reduce the models 32 times uh, and then bring them with a very similar quality. Uh, you have lack of real public implementations. We don't have much of the things that are stable and that can be commercialized, for example, which means we still have a lot of work to be done uh, at this level. Uh, lack of automation uh, to do this uh, quantization, for example. You need to have people who will be working. Uh, basically, it's a, it's, it's a, a try and fail, right? Trial and fail. So you see what is not working. 
so you try again, again and again until, until it works. This is also related to the diversity of physical architectures, right? It depends on your processor. It depends on the, capa the physical capacity that you have. So you need to have people who, will be, who should be uh, behind uh, that to control it. Again, we are investing a lot on this part, trying to bring some solutions to automate the quantization because it's very important. And uh, again, it, it should bring an answer to all those businesses who do not want to see their data moving outside their company. We don't have a killer application yet, uh, so more work is needed. Uh, for those who want to work there, there is really uh, a, a lot, a lot of, eff of effort that need to be spent. Learning on the edge, so that this started uh, lately, uh, basically, you have different approaches again, but the objective of what we want to do is to build directly the model on the edge, right? So we don't want the help of the cloud, we want to build directly on the edge, you have limited uh, constraints. Uh, and you need to work on that. You have different uh, methods. I'm listing them here, uh, but the most the most uh, used ones, I would say, is the distributed learning. So we are trying actually to distribute the learning on different devices. Uh, everybody is aware of the, uh, I guess, the federated learning, uh, but you have other methods also that are in the same uh, space, I would say. Uh, well, we are exploring it, but uh, here we need we need a sort of uh, well, we are exploring it from a theoretical perspective uh, in in the theory team. But when it comes to the uh, apply application or the concrete uh, sort of deployment of these kind of things, we get a lot of uh, physical constraints again that need to be solved. So we are trying to work on that, especially when you when you use, for example, uh, heterogeneous devices. That's not an easy task uh, to have, where in theory, for example, we try to uh, sort of make all those constraints as abstract constraints, but basically we don't, we don't take into consideration that. So we have the federated learning, we have the split learning that we, have, we are also exploring. Uh, transfer learning, uh, again, I will share the slides for those who, uh, who are interested, uh, just not to go in the technical things. Uh, but then we have this summary that we have tried to build uh, on the edge ML. So this is a taxonomy. Uh, again, we go back to the uh, edge inference, edge learning, and data pre-processing. You have a lot of methods that are there. Uh, but again, so in terms of papers, research papers, we have a lot of papers that are there. Uh, I think the paper we have uh, published has more than 250 references. Uh, but when it comes to the industry and the platforms that support those kind of things. This is very limited, and I think there is a need for investment uh, on that side to make things uh, happen. Because again, this will help bringing these LLMs to be built, or at least the inference could be done at a lower cost to generalize the use of these LLMs. So this is just a sort of a summary on the learning part. So. Uh, the generalization and the adaptation is complicated to do when you do the learning on the edge. Uh, well, we need to set the theoretical foundations uh, of, of that, the architectures. We are always facing the issue of heterogeneous devices. So this is an important thing that need, I believe need, needs to be uh, taken into consideration when we build that uh, theoretical foundation. Uh, you have the uh, sort of the hybrid approach that should be exploited in, in, in my opinion. Uh, hybrid in the sense that I can use the edge, but I can also use uh, the cloud as a collaboration between these, these two things. Data quality and assurance. Uh, any business you talk with will tell you that uh, I have issues with this. Uh, because again, we assume a lot that the data is good, but in reality, the data is not that good. So we need again to find sort of methods that would uh, verify the quality of the data. We have a PhD thesis that is working on that. And then you have the standardization that needs to come uh, again to, 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 to help us into this uh, diversity of devices. So I brought like uh, three use cases here just to show you quickly some of the work that we are doing in the, in the edge side. Uh, so this is George uh, who is trying to show us something. So what we are trying to do in this application actually 
is to show the possibility of building an edge, uh, uh, a model, a machine learning model, a neural network directly on the phone. Okay, we illustrate it on the activity monitoring. So what we are trying, what George is trying to have here, he has a small model that is running on his phone and he just checked uh, or showed that the, the working is, uh, I don't, we can identify it. And then he just tried a new uh, sort of uh, activity that is not known by, uh, by the model. So what will, he will be doing now is to just record some samples of data of that activity, and then he will rebuild the model again or update the model directly on the edge. Okay, so we're uh, here he's basically collecting some samples of data and shortly he will run, now he got tired, so now he can run the uh, training. The thing that is important here to keep in mind is that the training is happening on the phone, okay? We are not sending any data to the edge, uh, to, the, to the cloud, sorry, but everything is happening on the phone. It is taking a little bit of time. The idea was not the performance, but to show that there is this capability that uh, we can build and update the model directly on the edge. So now the model is, uh, has been updated. Now he will test, basically he will start the inference and see if the, the new sort of uh, data has been added to the model uh, or if the model has been updated or not. Uh, and then he shows that, and I think those who work a lot on uh, neural networks, we have this issue of catastrophic forgetting. As you learn new things, you forget the previous things. We have integrated that also in, in the system. We are able to incrementally uh, update the model while not forgetting the things that are uh, that have been already learned. So the second case, if I can go, is the sort of reinforcement learning uh, algorithms that we are using to help in the uh, navigation of the drones. We're trying actually here to combine image processing with reinforcement learning. The idea is to help the drone to autonomously explore an area without getting uh, or without colliding with the obstacles that you have. The, uh, the, the final objective is to run, of course, these models directly on the edge, on the, on the device that is the, uh, the, the drone. Uh, the nice thing here again is that we learn some situations. It's a reinforcement learning strategy. Uh, then the, the, I would say the environment can change, but the model is still working properly uh, and the drone will necessarily uh, prevent getting into uh, collisions against the walls. I just jump quickly to the to the where to the situation where we add okay it's this one normally so we have added some obstacles yeah you see the black obstacles are new they were not in the these ones they were not in the initial learning environment but the system is able to uh, identify or to recognize at least the obstacles and go further the next one and the last one is the web navigation so here what we are trying to do actually is to integrate the these models in the web navigation. Uh, so we have built a sort of extensions of the, of the browsers that, that you use and any page that you uh, visit, you can actually request for summarization. You can also discuss with the page, right? Or uh, sort of interact with the page with questions and answers. Uh, this, this, this can be working with the cloud, but again, what we wanted to do is to bring these things to run on the edge, right? So. What we have done, the work that we do on the quantization, we quantize the models and then we brought them to run on CPUs and then we add them to, when you get this uh, extension, you get actually an instance of the model that comes on your computer. So whenever you, you discuss with any page on the web, your data stays on the edge and it doesn't go, uh, it doesn't go outside, right? So here we have asked for the summary and then we started asking questions on the content that is on the web page. So uh, here, for example, how much funding is allocated toward low carbon solutions? And then 
with some uh, with, uh, after some time you should get an answer explaining uh, explaining that we have done different questions and then the system is getting the data from the page and solve all the problems but they will they should be also mixed with what we call traditional machine learning models and then you can have sort of hierarchies of model coordination of models as we do in web services for example and then have a sort of a more complex system that would bring solution for more complex problem and more adapted situation than what we have uh, nowadays so the future the future generative ai should be uh, multimodal that is that is an important thing to keep in mind we do not want only text or uh, or only images we need combination of different uh, uh, different types of data specialized models should be at the heart of the ecosystem uh, again we don't want huge models that are too generic uh, or at least not only uh, we need to build collaborative strategies between all those models uh, we need the reasoning capabilities so that we do not have nowadays. Uh, and then we have security and privacy that needs to be taken into consideration. And the last one, and I think it's the most important one, the actionability that needs to be attached to the, uh, the, these generative models. Uh, as of today, the models are only generating data, so they can recommend things for you, for example, things to do, uh, things to watch, things whatever. But then when it comes to the action, you have to do the action, right? You have to follow up and do the real work. Uh, there is a need to integrate some actionability in these models uh, to make them really supportive for the end user and for the businesses. I think that's all from my side. Thank you. I don't need to run. Uh, okay, I have a question uh, that now some phones starting to have some accelerators for specifically this computation, for example, neural engine in uh, iPhones. Uh, the question is uh, how accessible they are and uh, what is the perspective? Because as I understand now, they're not very accessible, like neural engine, etc. What do you think about perspective in like next three years? Well, that, that's a good question. Thanks, uh, Kirill. So I think the, the, these things have started always in, in the same, I would say, pattern, right? So the, the device is always expensive, but as we move, there are new technologies that are coming and they should be accessible. But to be fair, the people who are able to, <clears throat> again, it's a matter of uh, how much funding people have, right? So the people who are able to sort of uh, budget things for 4,000 GPUs for six months, I think that's accessible for us, right? So we started actually acquiring some of those devices, trying to sort of play with them at least for the moment uh, and see what we can do. But I think those will be generalized soon uh, with the new sort of architectures that we are having. Uh, you can check like NVIDIA, you have different companies that are trying to come up with new devices, with new architectures. So. In my opinion, that would come accessible much faster than we think. Uh, could edge AI be used in genet genetic engineering and nanorobotics? If yes, how? Yeah, that's a good uh, question. Uh, well, nanorobotics were not at that level, I believe. I mean, we need to explore, right? It's, it's a matter of how much computation we sort of we can exploit. Uh, so we need to look into that. I don't have a sort of direct answer uh, to that. I need to explore a little bit more. Uh, my understanding is that we don't have a lot of computation at uh, at that uh, at that levels. Uh, we need to look into that. But that that would be my answer for the moment. So, uh, because you are you are taking me really like much lower in terms of uh, 
in terms of edge, right? So we need to think about that. Thank you, Hakim. Any more questions? I think. So as far as I can get, uh, uh, what edge AI is about is that uh, the uh, the thing that's computed on the user's devices that's what's uh, what the users ask for. But uh, is there any room uh, for exploration about uh, computing everything like on the network of devices that are kind of signed signed in uh, to use the service, like something like uh, something something similar to a torrent? A network. Yes, there could be issues with privacy, but maybe ciphering the data would help or something. Yes, definitely. I mean, the edge alone, uh, I don't think that it will solve again all the issues, right? So I think there should be a collaborative approach where the edge is collaborating. I mean, with the small devices, they collaborating together, but they need also to collaborate with the cloud. So the what the message here is not saying that we should eliminate the cloud from the from the equation but it's more to collaborate devices they have to collaborate together but they still need to collaborate with the cloud because at the end of the day you may have some stuff that need to be collected at the cloud level and then computed there mm -hmm. but there, there could be a peer-to-peer -peer that's in terms of protocol you can have a peer-to-peer -peer approach where uh, different sort of devices are collaborating to build something yeah okay, thank you and thank you for the talk thank you thank yeah. you Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, so maybe related to a previous question, uh, what do you think about a multi-agent approach to LLMs where you don't have this one uh, giant uh, big boss LLM, but rather have a, a protocol of communication between different LLMs and maybe some uh, specialized LLMs know uh, how to better answer such question and uh, others uh, know how to answer a question in another domain or another language and uh, related uh, similar to human society there is certain distributed system is, is this more or less falls into this edge competition paradigm or that's completely different well i totally agree on that i'm totally i am really aligned to that and that's why i tried to build the figure that we have here so you need you will have the models what you call agent is basically a model right so the models they have to collaborate between them, right? But then this collaboration can happen one-to-one, uh, -one, for example, between a generative model and another one. Uh, but you could also use some more classical machine learning things because the generative model will not solve everything. But then you will have other layers also that will be coordinating uh, sort of more complex or building more complex, uh, more complex sort of logic uh, that needs uh, to be executed. Thanks, but uh, what, what uh, so the like human language is the most complex uh, system uh, ever invented, right? And this is actually a mechanism to, to communicate, uh, but for LLMs, for artificially created uh, systems, what should be this protocol? Do you have any idea? Should be this also human language or should be it artificial language? What should be efficient protocol mm -hmm. to perform this communication? like an interface or well i think that's i would say that's an open question we need to work a little bit more on that so <laughs> thank you yeah thank you well it seems that there are no more questions so uh, I still have someone uh, sorry i've not seen properly <laughs> go ahead go ahead uh, I wanted to ask, uh, are you concentrated on um, general tools and uh, technologies or you also uh, work with uh, requests from companies uh, about uh, their uh, precise tasks? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So I, I, would, I would answer to this question in terms of organization that we have. Uh, so from the, from the TII side, we are more into those, uh, that, that R&D. Uh, basically building those generic tools or uh, optimizing and you know like uh, working on this edge for example but then we have another entity that is called venture one that is more focusing on uh, interacting with the customers than sort of doing some fine-tuning and this kind of stuff so let's say a company uh, may come to you with their request and you will uh, tell them what you can do to optimize yeah. their process definitely yeah definitely okay we thank you you're welcome I'm making a pause to be sure. <laughs> I think we are good. 
Yeah, so, okay, let us uh, thank Hakim again. Thank you. And now almost immediately we have, uh, like in five minutes, we have start of the next session. So I'm reminding that it's we have two parallel sessions and uh, the one on theoretical machine learning and optimization will be in a, in a different room. And those who are following OP, they stay here. start our NLP session, session on machine learning and data analysis on the different whole room. Let's start with the first talk. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to present a work on multi-label topic classification for the Kyrgyz language, a joint work with Sergei Nikolenka of uh, Stekolov Mathematical Institute in St. Petersburg and other places, and Gulnara Kabaeva of Kyrgyz State Technical University named after Razakov. <clears throat> A little bit of introduction and motivation. Uh, Kyrgyz language is uh, one of the languages of the uh, Turkic family of the Kipchak branch, and um, many, well, several millions of people can call it their mother tongue, mainly, of course, in Kyrgyzstan, but also in China, Tajikistan, Pakistan, Uzbekistan, and Afghanistan, and Russia. However, uh, and despite uh, of a um, certain corpus of research work with uh, computational linguistics flavor uh, dedicated to Kyrgyz language, the number of open language resources for Kyrgyz is rather small. And upon trying to solve some applied problem um, that concerns uh, that involves usage of Kyrgyz language, um, one often meets with certain obstacles due to the lack of language resources. So one can say that language is definitely a low resource one. Uh, until recently, and here we, I think we can say thanks to Sberbank, uh, there was no general purpose LLMs for. Kyrgyz. Uh, however, as for many uh, other languages from those hundreds, uh, there are uh, two families of models that were trained in multiple languages on common crawl and other uh, large uh, bodies of text. Uh, one of these hundreds of languages is Kyrgyz. So one can attempt to use XLM or beta, base, large, etc., or bird based multilingual case. And as we've just discussed, although um, certain solutions may arise in the nearest years, the current NLP still leans towards universal models. Uh, but still, despite that, uh, uh, reliable evaluation for any language is necessary and arguably is impossible without manually annotated uh, resources. Uh, which is why we decided to develop, to make a first step to develop uh, the first data set for an applied task which could be suitable for uh, fine-tuning some LLMs for the applied Kyrgyz task to just find out whether it is at all possible. The, um, the, question is not, the, the answer to this question is not as evident as one may believe. Um, and after that, we will uh, publish a benchmark. A competition is ahead, so we haven't yet, but we'll publish a benchmark with all the results, all the models, and all the data. So uh, we've built our own data set with the kind permission of the editors of the 24KG agencies, that's the Kyrgyz News Agency. Uh, we've scraped the Kyrgyz language section of the site uh, that yielded 23-something thousand uh, news articles uh, and uh, the and on that side there were no topical texts for news and kickers so as you can see uh, at the bottom of the slide certain certain topics are present but uh, only Russian texts are annotated with those and um, actually they're not quite suitable they're too general in some some of those uh, so to say topics are actually multi-topic rubrics uh, so we had to decide on certain label set. To do that, one could try to use some general purpose thing, like 
uh, like they use in advertisement, like IAB taxonomy, DEMOS taxonomy in the older days. Uh, but those are also too broad. We have attempted some zero-shot approaches, uh, and unfortunately nothing worked. And in certain you know, uh, private conversations with practitioners, uh, um, I was told many times that when working with topical data from a single source, it unfortunately has to be custom. So that's what we're focused on. But uh, one cannot just uh, invent those labels. And we decided to do the um, so-called uh, exploratory annotation. To do that, we've translated, we've sampled 500 texts, we've translated all the titles into English, applied uh, sentence, uh, obtained sentence birth embeddings for all of them, and grouped them by hierarchical cluster, clustering, and then, uh, then the manual annotation. For every cluster, uh, we've attempted to invent a title which is uh, general enough to cover most of the news in the cluster, and then add some extra topical labels uh, for Mm, uh, for multi-topic texts. So after that quick and dirty annotation, we, we did the re-annotation again from, uh, from, from, the, from the start, because, say, the second half of the data, some labels that we've introduced there were not available at the start. So that's the example of the cluster and the proposed annotation. Clearly, all the texts are about certain fines, certain crimes, but sometimes with a political flavor, sometimes with ecological flavor, and so on. Having done that, we've decided that uh, the label set is established, and then uh, we've done the same thing with two 500 text batches, uh, which yielded a data set of 1,500 texts. So the first two batches were, were then used as a training set, 500, uh, the last 500 were used as a test set, and here's the statistics. Uh, here are this is the label statistics for the first two batches. Uh, one can see that, well, arguably, the distributions of labels are relatively similar, which uh, can also arguably signify that the annotation procedure and the annotation scheme were relatively consistent in the process, so hopefully usable. Uh, this yielded 20 topics. Um, as for experimental setup, uh, well, it was pretty standard, uh, but uh, with a multi-label sp uh, multi uh, twist, we had to uh, do uh, an accurate splitting so that the distributions of the labels in, in the splits would be similar. So we did iterative certification for um, bag of engrams models, we would use two-fold uh, cross-validation because the data set is rather small. Uh, for uh, neural approaches, uh, which are computationally harder, we've used a simple train dev split, but basically the same splitting procedure. For sentence tokenization, we've used an LTK, and uh, we're lucky to have a morphological analyzer for Kyrgyz language uh, from the project Apertium, Apertium Cur, and that's we've used for something that one could call stemming, and uh, and basic word tokenization, uh, solely because that's um, I guess uh, well one could use an LTK or something, or something um, something maybe from the standard package, but this is something one uh, something that seems to be more or less standard for Kyrgyz. Okay, now for the models. So we are we're about to build a ben benchmark. And uh, we've uh, tried some very basic um, bag of engrams models with an extensive hyperparameter uh, hyperparameter tuning, and those were uh, there were two groups of methods. Uh, one one group is uh, based on uh, linear models and uh, well uh, on logistic regression and on stochastic gradient descent with. Uh, um, well, basically on uh, stochastic, uh, basically on uh, linear SVM and logistic regression. Uh, the first approach uh, that we call independent uh, classifiers, just uh, which this is just a set of independent binary classifiers for each labels, for each label. Uh, and uh, the chain approach is also standard, 
approach with classifiers uh, that are um, trained in a row and um, the data for training for for the next one in the sequence uses predictions of the previous one um, the other approaches may not be a great choice for large sparse vectors but uh, we've included them since they are truly multi-label and yet uh, classical enough uh, simple uh, nearest neighbors flavor for um, multi-label classification and here go the results um, so uh, for evaluation we've used several metrics probably the most uh, descriptive one is uh, Jacquard index sample wise sample wise Jacquard index computed for uh, every pair of predicted label of for the sets of predicted labels and sets of um, gold standard labels and average the overall samples. Uh, so the numbers show that the performance is not that great overall. Uh, also, we've computed exact matches, Hamming distance, um, F measures uh, the microaveraging flavor, and also sample averaged version. We have also added uh, um, the count of the percentage of times when uh, when at least one label was guessed correctly. What we see here, the first approach is uh, a simple bag of raw token engrams uh, with different hyperparameters. So these are the best uh, groups of uh, hyperparameters that we found with grid search and for each uh, family. And um, the results are not great. And uh, clearly, as expected, uh, the uh, nearest neighbors methods perform poorly. And when we move from raw tokens to character engrams, also quite expectedly, we get a boost in performance. Uh, when we move to stamp tokens, we also, if you will just compare the numbers here and here. When moving to the stem tokens, we also get an improvement, also quite expectedly, since Kyrgyz language is a morphologically rich agglutinative language, uh, and removing uh, all or almost all affixes gives a boost. An interesting observation is that when we take stems and, um, and also convert them to character engrams, this also allows to improve the results. And that's it with the very basic approaches, but probably the most uh, important thing we, we were planning to do for, with this benchmark, apart from publishing it, is trying uh, some, um, fine-tuning some multilingual uh, language model. Uh, we miserably failed uh, with uh, training BERT multilingual, so it just couldn't produce any reasonable results, uh, however hard we tried. But we've achieved certain success with uh, Robeta Lodge, with BPE tokenization. Uh, and uh, as you see, it outperforms all the previous approaches by a large margin. Uh, it is also important to note that uh, for bag of engrams, bag of stems approaches, uh, we did quite an extensive hyperparameter uh, sweep, hyperparameters.
you may have noticed that this uh, annotation approach, this, uh, this size of the data set and everything else is not without flaws. And uh, we're going to add some more new uh, evaluations to the benchmark. First of all, we'll try to apply the model that has appeared uh, before the iced uh, deadline, the one, uh, the MGPT uh, Kyrgyz. Um, it is also, and uh, as uh, the reviewers uh, right, rightly noted, that it would also be nice to translate the Kyrgyz texts automatically into English and apply some um, English-based models like BERT or something, just fine-tuning to test how, to, well, this is clearly the something that should be done for lower source languages to test uh, what can be achieved by state-of-the-art. Uh, also, we believe that, uh, that zero-shot learning prompt engineering approaches, uh, which were not quite successful when we tried them, uh, should not be thrown away, uh, and uh, maybe we, maybe we shall uh, return to that, uh, to certain um, articles conversion into something uh, for prompt. But most importantly, I guess, and uh, due to certain recent developments in Bishkek, that is kind of kind of easier now. We will annotate more data uh, with uh, the help of multiple uh, native speakers. Uh, and we will do it properly with the uh, with the instruction, uh, with a fixed instruction, and uh, several notators per sample. Uh, just since I have some time, uh, just just a short note. Uh, this work was carried out mostly, uh, at least the annotations were carried out out mostly in 2022. But uh, something changed in 2023. A large community evolved, a large data science community evolved, a large sub community of volunteers uh, appeared in Bishkek, and we've done something else some named entity recognition data sets, and uh, some more efforts are on the way, such as yet another Kyrgyz corpus. Uh, so uh, there is more work uh, that lies ahead. And uh, it, of course, should be done, whether or not without our participation. I think that's it. Thank you for your attention. So thanks. Uh, a lot of work has been done. Uh, and uh, one question which I'm interested in is uh, whether transfer learning strategy uh, through multilingual uh, language models uh, is preferable over just pure translation of data sets. Let's say you don't have resources for Kyrgyz, uh, you have a machine translation, the only thing you have, you have a machine translation system. One way is to just blindly take and translate uh, the data sets and train something, uh, and then you will uh, get uh, and you train a model specific language, let's say Kyrgyz uh, MGPT. Uh, you get certain quality. Or another way is you get uh, a multilingual model which supports a lot of languages. You train on, uh, let's say, English data set, and you assume that somewhere in the model there is a separation of knowledge. Let's say uh, some um, model learns to, uh, let's say, detect sentiment, positive, negative sentiment. But then it transferred to Kyrgyz. So, in practice, if you just need to choose which which uh, which would be, in your opinion, working, uh, let's say, better uh, out of the box. Oh, thanks for the question. Uh, so, uh, let me just clarify. So, the first part was uh, about translating something into Kyrgyz, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, that's uh, that's actually a great idea, and that's something that uh, colleagues are doing, uh, co colleagues in Kyrgyzstan are doing for other tasks. But I would also like to ask you to clarify the last part of the question. Uh, the last part would be not to translate, to assume that translation is uh, prone to errors, and instead you train on a clean data set, let's say for English, uh, but using not monolingual model, but the multilingual model, which just was pre-trained on Kyrgyz, so it knows that Kyrgyz exists, but you, it, it, it trained on some English uh, data set or Russian data sets. 
And then it starts to solve tasks in, in Kyrgyz. Uh, and then the question is, is, which is more preferable strategy to, to translate with errors, but still learn on uh, monolingual model uh, for the target language uh, without, uh, or rather go this knowledge transfer approach? Yeah, thank you for the question yet again. Uh, it's a good question, and I don't have a good answer, unfortunately. I have beliefs only for that. Uh, first thing, I've uh, I've met uh, what uh, I've met the thing with training on English and shared knowledge within the multilingual model. We, we, we did that with information extraction. We've seen that effect, but uh, from my experience on other tasks of the sort with uh, Russian language mostly. I believe that uh, the first option is more preferable. So translating something, some standard data set, uh, if possible, right, uh, to Kyrgyz and fine tuning on it should be better, I think, based on based on my experience on, on the tasks that are slightly less relevant than they could be. Th that's also kind of my experience, that it's a very strong baseline, but I just wanted to <laughs> learn from Thanks. That's it. Yeah, thank you for your talk. I have several questions. The first one are just an idea because normally if you don't have a lot of data set on some task, you search for another language that is quite close to this one. So do you know which language are close to Kyrgyz and other models uh, related to that. So maybe in future work you could rely not only to the multilingual ones, not only to uh, translation, so maybe using some like Russian, Belarusian, Ukrainian probably, so they are related and you can probably tune some models, so what's, what's your experience in this case? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, speaking of the similar tasks in similar languages, uh, I've seen, well, speaking of this particular task, text classification, even without the multi-label twist, what I found uh, like to the best of my knowledge, uh, there are some data sets in Turkish and in Kyrgyz written in Arabic script, the Chinese flavor of Kyrgyz. And, uh, mm, and nothing else that I found. But uh, speaking of uh, translations into similar languages, yeah, there's that work uh, of 2020 by the Turkic interlingual community, which is now, uh, I guess, special interest group in Turkic languages of ACL. Uh, their model could be used, probably, uh, but uh, for, for the task, but I really mm, don't see any data sets of the sort in other languages. But of course, uh, the Turkic language processing community does exist. The in uh, uh, well, Kyrgyz is uh, rather scarce in terms of resources, but uh, the situation is a bit different with, of course, Turkish language, Uzbek uh, language, uh, Tatar language. But um, for this task, I haven't found anything else. Okay, thank you. And one more quick question: Are uh, your data set that you are creating is very specific, so it's multi-label and it's in Kyrgyz, and you told that you're going to uh, re reuse it in during some for benchmarks for Kyrgyz or some uh, other things, like correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, is there any reasons why this specific data set are multi-label, because like there are many other tasks that you could start with, were there another specific reason for some application maybe, or what was... Okay, thanks. Uh, but well, um, I would say that, uh, oh, okay, uh, there was not some any specific, you know, motivation or inspiration for that, apart from the fact that, well, in my opinion and vision, uh, topic classification is one of the, I think, tasks that an uh, uh, average data scientist could meet uh, in uh, one's practice, right? So something like, I don't know, things like sentiment analysis or topic classification and I don't know, maybe maybe that's it. I mean, name dance recognition is already something uh, on a different level. So yeah. that was the motivation and, uh, and it, it is like one of the classic tasks of information retrieval. So I just decided that that was a good idea. Yeah, true, thank you, thank you very much.
yes. Um, sorry if I missed something in the beginning, but uh, can you elaborate a bit about the annotation uh, uh, quality check? How do you guarantee that the, and how many annotators do you use uh, some crowdsourcing or do you have plans for this? Yeah, uh, um, the pretty descriptive, uh, thanks for the question. Yeah, the, 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 the pretty descriptive uh, phrase in the beginning was quick and dirty. So uh, that's it. So uh, I was actually uh, planning at some point, uh, well, I, I have a certain access to experts that are more proficient in Kyrgyz language with na native speakers that, that would that would check uh, yet again. I mean, uh, one of the authors is from Kyrgyzstan, but uh, but still, uh, so so yeah. Uh, the only the only more or less sophisticated procedure uh, for um, establishing something, guaranteeing some quality, was the one I've described on choosing the label set. Um, as for the quality quality check, that was just reading stuff multiple times. Okay, thank you uh, for the work. By two people. Anyway, anyway, it's a lot of work. Okay, so ah, there's the remote. Let me check. Yes. So I'll start uh, straight with a brief introduction to the problem. Uh, the summarization, there are two approaches. Extractive leverages existing text fragments to select a set of um, um, highlights. And abstractive summarization uh, improves on extractive by uh, employing additional language resources to paraphrase and combine the set fragments into concise sentences. Now, uh, the main uh, approach to solve abstractive summarization is sequence to sequence, where we have an encoder, encoder to extract the contextual information and decoder that generates the summary in accordance to this contextual information. And the preference, the preference is justified uh, since uh, GPT models that have several times more parameters uh, just fail uh, to achieve uh, the level of performance of in, uh, specialized encoder and decoder counterparts, especially even uh, after fine tuning, as was proved uh, in, on the second plot. That's from official OpenAI article about summarization. So they proved that T5 uh, performs better. Uh, in terms of human evaluation, then they're fine-tuned uh, GPT-3. And um, now there's an evidence that classic sequence-to-sequence -sequence approach is not enough. Uh, several works uh, just showed that uh, integrating extractive summarization in training and inference um, and loop uh, improves the quality substantially, especially for full transformer models. Uh, let me, ah, the point of works, right. So uh, that what uh, distinguishes full transformer models from other architectures is that beside um, uh, encoder-decoder bridging, the attention is used for all intermediate um, embeddings in all layers meaning that the overall impact of attention is much larger to an extent that uh, attention patterns are now a part of um, initialization of uh, summarization models. So the models that are more aligned with ground truth uh, extractive labels happen to perform better, converge faster to more optimal results since uh, they spend less time um, if searching for important sentences and just learn to paraphrase and combine them. So many researchers argued that uh, it could be beneficial to correct this attention. And the first approach is to use the local mechanism uh, binary masking uh, binary masking of attention mechanism. So it uh, works by just selecting the important parts of the sequence 
And the problem is that it's equivalent of token removal, meaning that the model would not attend to the masked parts, so the information won't be propagated, and mainly the whole uh, information, the centrality of the context would be shifted in the other direction, meaning that the optimal sum summary would be different. So to alleviate the issue, the researchers came up with an idea to apply the, the content selection masking uh, to a subset of layers and attention heads. Uh, they do so by searching for layers responsible for silency evaluation and uh, applying the mask uh, obtained from some content selector, maybe an extractive summarization system, maybe some query from the user. And the alternative, the only existing alternative to that approach is uh, just uh, complementing the existing attention mechanism to receive some more complex uh, guidance signals. Uh, well, relevant attention, uh, this is the latest and state-of-the-art approach, uses uh, semantic query uh, document uh, matrix and applies some simple uh, linear transformations and uh, aligns it uh, using some simple interpolation with uh, cr uh, cross-attention weights uh, to guide the decoder to query uh, relevant positions. And we uh, hypothesize that uh, actually uh, there is no benefit in tampering with existing attention mechanism because it still uh, interferes with uh, natural information flow. And for alternative solution, we looked for inspiration in image processing area, uh, namely uh, text-to-image. Uh, well, DALI, uh, text-to-image uh, uh, model, uses uh, one uh, interesting technique. Um, it has no name. They call it just result blending. It uses, uh, it, it is based on the idea that uh, the model uses clip embeddings that maps uh, both text and image embeddings into the same uh, vector space, meaning that if we uh, take two different uh, prompts, uh, two different uh, text uh, sequences, encode them, and then just uh, take a weighted average, uh, we will obtain some intermediate image embedding. And it seems that uh, the result is quite stable. So following the same idea, we derived a biased encoder mixture. Uh, it is quite simpler. Uh, we don't use different inputs. We just use different attention masks. So uh, one, the full attention mask go from uh, through original encoder uh, using the original input. And uh, then we derive a uh, content uh, selected mask and process it. Uh, well, we can use the original encoder or uh, an auxiliary. It is uh, just our expansion. Um, the theory is that if we use an encoder that is uh, more sensitive to masking, that is more uh, focused on masked positions, it would provide um, more amplified signals that would uh, better guide the original embedding to uh, query relevant positions, and so the decoder uh, would produce more optimal results. So to test uh, the method, we derived uh, two masking strategies. Uh, first is based on uh, just using uh, ground truth st uh, extractive label statistics, and the second one is dynamic. In case if we are planning to use it uh, in practice. It, it is based on you know, extractive summarization system, just any kind. We just need uh, some distribution over uh, sentences that would uh, denote the silency of the set position. And so to obtain the mask, we just uh, use top P something of these of this, uh, sentence position distributions. We evaluated uh, the methods on four domains. Um, well, no, three domains. Just uh, one is represented with two data sets. So news, uh, science, and dialogue. Uh, we used res the respective state-of-the-art models. And uh, to determine 
everything for the methods we used simple bridge search on validation part and uh, quantitative results are quite promising uh, well uh, bias encoder mixture seems to outperform every uh, attention modulation um, method um, well, in almost every scenario. And in best case uh, scenario, uh, bias encoder mixture can bring up to 8% improvement over the, over the original. Um, and in terms of quality, well, it was uh, important question. So how it uh, performs, does it violate the coherency, the relevance? And it seems that none of the methods uh, uh, violate these uh, constraints. Uh, there is uh, a sampling from the news uh, data set. Uh, so there's a reference, the original model prediction, and then there is a set of um, alterations, corrections. So relevance attention is based uh, on semantic similarity matrix. It just uh, injects the named entities into the original. Uh, generation layer attention does uh, the contrary it deletes uh, some excessive uh, entities like there was china and other nations now it's just china and the uk is now replaced with official say which is uh, quite questionable and bias encoder mixture is the most different of the bunch uh, it just uh, simply forces the model to revise the, the whole summary uh, since it uh, since it's creates a new embedding, the model understands that text is likely to be different. And so uh, the new summary uh, tells us the story about the drones, uh, submarine drones that can walk independently and uh, track uh, over thousands of miles. Uh, and basically, bias encoder mixture version is more aligned with the reference summary. And so about the patterns, about the alteration patterns, uh, they are also different. In, well, the original generation can disagree with the reference at any position, meaning that uh, the generated summary can be quite different uh, from the reference. So the attention-based methods that don't take into account the initial mistakes from the initial positions. However, uh, they scale with the article length. So closer to the ending, they introduce the changes, and their attention is just guaranteed uh, to revise the ending. Biased encoder mixture is more radical and more uh, uniform, yet uh, still a bimodal. Um, it is um, more aligned, of course, with the uh, intended reference distribution. And um, as we've seen before, it can completely for, uh, it can force the model to completely revise the generated summary. And in terms of semantics, um, well, the attention based are quite conservative. Uh, re the relevance attention, uh, since it uses semantic similarity matrix, uh, just keeps everything in check with the original generation. Layer attention is more brave and just uh, has a wider range of um, uh, semantic changes. And the biased encoder mixture is uh, the bravest, I would say. Uh, it just uh, can simply, uh, it can completely diverge from the original meaning, yet it's still uh, better aligns with the intended um, extractive summary. So this concludes my presentation. I'd be glad to answer your questions. So basically, you use in this data set. Is there any good data set for Russian that can be used for reference? Well, you're referring to the news data sets from multilingual or the one that was collected by Gusev, but they are quite noisy. The reason why I chose CNN Daily Mail for ablation or for 
case study is because it is uh, the data set that was proved to have uh, it was written by editors. The summaries were written by editors, so they are quite aligned. The Gusev uh, used um, uh, automatically extracted uh, summaries, and sometimes they they are filled with just some automated um, things, so they are aren't so uh, so reliable for the experiments. And besides, uh, there are no just uh, counterparts uh, like I mean I used Brio Pegasus models and yeah brio pegasus but so it's summarize, summarization specialized uh, models there are just none for the russian thank you i have a question it's more like a theoretical question do you think your model or like your, am i true that the data set you are using it's summarizing just only one article like not multiple summarization multiple of multiple articles, right? Yes, it does. Do you think it would be possible to transfer this summarization to like multiple article summarization and like, is it applicable or not? Or what could be the difficulties uh, the to technique, do this? Uh, you're asking for a technique. Well, uh, yeah. you, well, of course, uh, one of the main approaches to uh, solve uh, multi-document summarization, it just pretend it, it is just like uh, one long document with multiple chapters. So just using some special markers, some special uh, tokens, uh, we can produce some special embeddings for these chapters. And so it's indistinguishable from the same long sequence. And yes, of course, uh, biased encoder mixture can be applied to any model that has encoder. So even if you have multiple encoders, if you, well, that's one, one of the approaches, that's just to use uh, an, an individual encoder for each part, for each document, then yes, you can still apply the same approach for multi-document, yes. Yeah, thank you. Because normally the problem of multi-document summarization is that if you just make them as one long document, normally the model looks at the beginning of the text and of the end of the text because it contains like the most summarized information that the model should look into. That's why sometimes at some experiments, as I have seen, it doesn't work when you just uh, combine all the all the sentences, all the text in one large text. That's why I was thinking, yeah, so how it could be? Well, yes, uh, the context uh, window is just limited and the, the attention patterns just get lost. So it could be. Uh, uh, now I recall, yes, it was uh, one of the earliest work before Transformers, and they really did. They used multiple encoders and uh, just interpolated their embeddings. Well, using, of course, not just simple interpolation, they used a fully uh, connected layer to just to combine these embeddings into one and just uh, pass them to decoder. And, and they proved, uh, well, they said it worked better than just you passing the long sequence. But of course, it was uh, the recurrent uh, neural networks. Now we have uh, GPTs, and so they claim they can accept, uh, accept the context of up to 8,000 uh, tokens. Yes, so I just don't know. Never yeah. tested. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Ekaterina Zalivina and today I present my work automatic detection of dialectal pictures of Scott dialects and speech of native speakers. Uh, the purpose of my research uh, is uh, to create a model for transcribing dialect speech. Uh, in this work we focus on um, Scott dialects and provide researchers with a tool to detect uh, dialectal features characteristic of these dialects in the speech of informants. Why uh, it is important uh, as a field researcher, I know firsthand that uh, field data is collected uh, manually. So our tool allows to reduce the amount of manual work uh, and uh, concentrate on analyzing linguistic phenomena. And we present experiments using Russian dialect data, which are not so common uh, now uh, in solving the problem of automatic speech recognition. Uh, what about the steps? Uh, first, we collect uh, corpus data, then uh, form a manifest uh, for automatic speech recognition task, and to do the manual annotation for detecting features. Uh, we fine-tune uh, models uh, 
for speech recognition uh, and uh, have three approaches uh, for uh, detecting uh, uh, features. And uh, we choose the best approaches and create uh, a big pipeline to work with them. Uh, what was the data? Uh, data in the corpus, uh, uh, oh, no. This one, uh, we must mention that the, uh, was a, and, uh, is two corpora were taken and the data in which was collected during expeditions to Tver region and uh, Napskov region. And on the map, you can see the location uh, of the villages where the data was collected. And it is worth noting that uh, the Opochetsky villages are located closer to the borders uh, of Latvia and Belarus. Uh, although these uh, dialects belong to the Pskov dialects uh, and uh, existing dialect classifications note quite a lot of differences between them. Uh, how we pre-process audio data, we uh, take uh, uh, files from corpus, uh, a files or text grid files, uh, we export annotation to text grid files to have uh, uh, the similar files, and then we uh, have uh, an audio segmentation based on uh, sentence lens. Uh, we claim punctuation, uh, convert uh, all to lowercase, and uh, we generate the file uh, in format uh, that presented on a slide. And uh, you can see uh, a little bit of statistics uh, that we achieved, uh, and uh, we, I can say that these uh, very low resource uh, dialects and uh, we work with a little amount of data. And uh, about uh, text data annotation uh, for binary classification, uh, for each annotation uh, we assigned one if uh, it uh, demonstrated the implementation one or more dialect features, otherwise uh, zero. And for rule based and token classification approaches, uh, you know, each token in the annotation was assigned tag in the IOB2 annotation, where B is the beginning of the sequence, I is the second or subsequent tokens of the sequence, and O is the absence of dialect feature, and on the slide it's presented uh, the sample of annotation. Uh, about the right tuning approach. Uh, it was uh, four approaches, uh, and uh, we can see that uh, we have two corpus, uh, and uh, for first approach, we uh, train on first corpus and then test on uh, the same corpus. And the same approach is for second corpus. And uh, third and fourth approaches, uh, uh, we have uh, two iterations of fine tuning. Uh, first one, uh, we uh, you know, fine tune on the Podendvinsky data, and uh, then on Apochetsky data and test on Zapodinsky data. And uh, first, uh, we uh, train the same way and uh, test uh, on Apochetsky data. Uh, we use the base matrix uh, for this task. Uh, for speech recognition, is uh, word error rate and character error rate. And for dialect features detection, uh, precision recover for one score and accuracy. Uh, speech recognition, we select models that uh, were pre-trained on standard Russian. Uh, we use uh, three architectures. Uh, among the common mistakes of the two uh, first models are combining two tokens into one, uh, splitting one token in two parts, inserting characters. Uh, and to correct such errors, uh, we use a spell checker, Yandex Spell. And we see results on the slide, uh, and uh, we see that for uh, Zapodnodvinsky data, uh, the best model is the first when we uh, train on this data and test on this. But for Pochetsky data, the best results uh, is a first approach. When we fine tune on Zapodnodvinsky data, then on Pochetsky data, and uh, we get better results. Uh, for detection uh, of dialect features, uh, we use uh, three approaches. 
uh, binary classification of uh, entire sentence, binary classification of token, and uh, multi-class classification of each token. Um, as for based, a rule-based approach, uh, we uh, took a list of phonetic, morphological, and syntactic dialect features uh, from grammatical sketch. Uh, then for each rule, uh, we write uh, the function. For example, uh, to determine the realization of phoneme in the first prestressed syllable. Now, we follow this uh, algorithm. We use the uh, uh, dictionary parser library to obtain transcriptions instead of Russian. Uh, then we determine the backness and the height of press dress vowel, vowel and uh, the presence of palatalized consonant before the vowel. And for morphological and syntactic features, uh, we used Pymorphy tool and Natasha. Uh, we note that uh, this approach successfully handles correct tech identification after detect detection for dialect features at the level of phonetics and morphology. Uh, but uh, variability is not taken into account uh, and all positions in which dialect feature can be realized are marked with an attack. But uh, we know that uh, now it is uh, very common to have variability in dialects. Uh, about entire audio classification, for each audio fragment, uh, my frequency uh, capsule case and uh, were calculated and uh, uh, during the experiments, three classifiers were, were used. Uh, and uh, as a result, we see that the method is uh, more appreciable rather as one of the intermediate stages, uh, but the problem of classifi classifying tokens within a fragment is not solved still. Uh, in this case, we see reliance on the, on the audio but, uh, and uh, consideration of reliability. And uh, about token classification, uh, we fine tune XML Roberta for two sets uh, of tech, uh, binary and uh, multi class. Uh, and uh, we see strong influence of uh, reliability on the choice of classifier. Uh, but uh, we see that uh, this approach still cannot cope with uh, uh, lexical and syntactic features. Uh, Next, we decide to have experiments with the Pochetsky data, uh, the rule base. Uh, it shows results higher than on the Podnodvinsky data, which may indicate uh, only more consistent implementation of the features in speech of informants. Uh, and about entire audio classification, it is important that uh, the implementation uh, is impossible without training uh, only on the target data, uh, only on the Zapnodvinsky data, and it is uh, necessary to train on uh, target dialect too. Uh, and the last token classification, uh, we see that uh, models detect very few dialect features uh, without fine tuning on the target data, but uh, it uh, rather uh, good results for uh, after uh, fine tuning on this data, and uh, we uh, create a pipeline to work with the best models, and uh, our recording in web format is accepted uh, as input data. Uh, we convert audio uh, to a single channel format. Then uh, we divide the recording uh, based of uh, areas of silence, fragments of audio below special decibel threshold, and uh, we get transcriptions uh, with the best model. Uh, to, uh, then we also have uh, a tag for each token, and uh, we generate finally two formats, uh, text grid and EF, to work with uh, Prat and UN programs. And uh, on this slide, uh, you can see uh, how it looks like uh, in the UN program. Uh, and uh, conclusion, uh, if the goal uh, is to get the model to recognize one se uh, selected dialect, by tuning uh, a model that have already seen a closed dialect, we will get uh, a better results. 
uh, then fine tuning a model pre-trained only in standard Russian. And we see it on uh, the case of Opochitsky data. Uh, thus, phonetic, morphological, syntactic, and lexical differences uh, between closed dialects do not impair the quality of recognition. And uh, the, last, the last data to fine tune should be the dark uh, target dialect from which the model is being trained and not some close one, otherwise the quality will be lower and we see it uh, in the case of Zapadnodvinsky data. And a new hypothesis has been put forward for further research uh, to create a universal dialect speech recognition model and it is necessary to fine tune the model on the entire sample of dialects at the same time. Thank you, that's all. Questions? Uh, I have a question. I'm not familiar with scope dialects. Uh, if, could you summarize, I don't know, the difference in linguistics points of view? Because I don't know exactly what's the difference between them. Uh, yeah, they had uh, a lot of similarities, but difference, uh, differences too. And uh, uh, they had uh, realization, uh, different realizations of phoneme. Uh, they had uh, morphological uh, differences, for example, in, uh, uh, in uh, Opochtsky dialect, they have palatalized final uh, consonant uh, in the short present form of verbs, and uh, 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 Zapadadvinsky, in Zapadadvinsky data, this case, but in Opochtsky data, they uh, don't, don't have uh, uh, last consonant at all. And uh, uh, we have uh, a list of features, and uh, in most of them, uh, uh, they have uh, little differences. I guess uh, linguistic community know it for a while. Yeah. <laughs> um, could it be that you can uh, artificially generate one dialect from another knowing those rules? in order to increase data in training sets? It's a good question. I don't know exactly, but I think it is possible. But nobody. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so maybe it's a bit uh, under generic question but uh, so these linguistic uh, expeditions uh, uh, could they be somehow modernized now with let's say modern technologies or mobile phones and llms or something like this let's say you just uh, install certain application and uh, ask uh, some some people to interact with uh, some dialogue agent and then the the, the data or is collected uh, more or less distributed way in a very cheap way. Uh, could this be? Uh, could, could, do people actually start to think about these kind of practices, or there is certain inherent uh, limitation uh, for linguistic uh, data collection in this way? Uh, now it is uh, <laughs> not popular at all to use modern uh, instruments and in expeditions. Uh, I was in expeditions uh, expedition this uh, uh, year, and we still uh, go here with uh, micro. We write, uh, uh, we record uh, uh, informants uh, speakers, and then to manually annotate their speech. Uh, but uh, this uh, uh, my work. Uh, I believe that uh, I mm, have done a step to modernize uh, the process of this. And I believe that uh, we will uh, go next year to the expedition and uh, use this uh, tool. Thank you. OK, thank you for the talk. Quite condensed. Uh, it's good uh, question. Uh, good that you found new hypothesis uh, my question is about this uh, proposal for universal uh, dialect speech recognition model. 
how this should operate, what, 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 what is your vision of this model and what is the purpose of this model? Should it predict like a multi-label, like given the speech, it should predict like one out of 100 or maybe 10, I don't know how many dialects or something different. And why people need this model? Uh, I think that uh, now we have uh, dictionaries and uh, other sources where uh, dialect features uh, are <clears throat> compare with each other in uh, different dialects. And uh, I believe that we can uh, find more uh, if uh, we try to optimize this process. And uh, also, uh, I should say about variability that uh, some features uh, are died and uh, we should uh, see what is, uh, still, uh, what is still uh, in the dialects uh, we can see. Okay, but uh, is this task can be solved just building some atlas or some uh, like reference uh, of all the dialects? Why why do you need machine learning model uh, or whatever? All uh, 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 resources uh, was collected uh, 15, 7, 50, 70 years ago, and uh, it should be modernized. And I think that uh, it is one of possible way to do it. Also. Okay. Some questions uh, regarding the practical application of this uh, this interesting instrument. First, thank you for the talk. And uh, you have already said that it hasn't uh, uh, yet been used for uh, like in the expeditions, but it could be interesting. Uh, like first, if if the if it's not one hundred percent that well, if it's not one hundred percent quality, maybe it uh, sh can first be used like to guide the. Uh, the, the, the scientists and then they could correct uh, the, the mistakes. And uh, second, it could be interesting to look at uh, if the model and the scientists make mistakes in different or in the same places. So maybe uh, the model could, could help them in the specific uh, places where they are unsure. Uh, yes, of course, uh, as a first uh, step, uh, it uh, should be corrected uh, by the uh, experts. And uh, then uh, uh, I think that the uh, model uh, can uh, reach uh, better result if we train on the entire sample of dialect. Uh, and uh, it is two parallel process for me, no, as I can, I can see. Uh, and uh, about uh, the second, uh, uh, can you repeat, please? Yeah. But it could be interesting to look at if yeah. the model and scientists make mistakes in the same places or not. Uh, I uh, uh, analyze only uh, models uh, errors, uh, but uh, it is interesting to see annotators error, uh, errors and compare them. Uh, so I, uh, I think that it uh, will be uh, good enough to do it in future. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm curious, uh, what are the most notable differences uh, between Pskov dialects and the standard Russian? Oh, uh, they have uh, unique phonetics. For example, uh, uh, I was, uh, I, I talked uh, about uh, uh, first prestressed syllable. Uh, they have uh, yakanya. Uh, for example, uh, then they had a uh, unique uh, syntactic structure. Uh, they have uh, uh, verbs forms that we don't have uh, in uh, Russian standard language. And uh, also they have uh, uh, in our uh, mind disagreement between uh, auxiliary verbs uh, and uh, you know, verb uh, as a main. So the lot of differences uh, we can see also in uh, constructions uh, and uh, morphology. 
Got it, thank you. And uh, do I understand correctly that uh, this dialect is influenced by the Belarusian language? Um, we have uh, some uh, researches about it uh, and uh, uh, of course uh, the main, uh, the main um, influence is the uh, standard version because of TV uh, 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 people that was born that were born uh, recently uh, and other but uh, in some cases they have uh, uh, influence of beverages too got it thank you hello everyone thank you for coming uh, today we are talking about compression of large language model based on transformer architectures and compression is uh, are provided uh, by matrix or tensor decompositions decompositions the field of natural language processing has made significant progress with the development of large language model based on transformer architectures. Uh, nevertheless, transformer models share a common challenge of expanding scale, presenting an obstacle presenting an obstacle uh, to model employment and training, especially uh, for uh, small research groups. So in our work, we decided uh, to reduce the size of large language models. For example, BART and BART, it is, it, uh, it, uh, these are encoder-based language models, uh, by the compression, the initial layer, using tensor and matrix decomposition. Uh, so we have BERT and BART, and uh, this is model based on transforming architecture, and uh, most uh, of parameter, uh, several work show that many parameters into this model are redundant. Uh, so we decided to uh, take several layers, select several layers, and compress it. Uh, we see uh, how many parameters can contained in the different layers inside the model. Every transformer architecture consists of MLP blocks, embedding blocks, and attention block. And uh, how you can see into this table, uh, the concerning BERT and BART, and uh, this is out of scope of this presentation, but uh, this is true for GPT-2.2, for the quarter based model too. Uh, the most number of parameters um, are in the MLP block. Uh, so we decided to take MLP block, uh, take layers inside this. MLP block consists of uh, two fully connected layers and uh, apply several decomposition to it. Uh, we decided to uh, take one matrix decomposition, is a singular value decomposition, uh, matrix decomposition with, with, uh, with Fisher information, uh, one uh, tensor based decomposition, tensor train matrix decomposition, and tensor train matrix decomposition with Fisher information. So we uh, made this variant of decomposition and replaced fully connected layers inside the proper architecture uh, with uh, the um, corresponding representation. As a baseline, we take full model, uh, model uh, which uh, was obtained by downcasted uh, the full model by PyTorch FP16. Uh, in PyTorch FP16, uh, we started to represent our weight not uh, into the floating point of uh, uh, with uh, 32 precision, but with floating uh, with 16 precision and uh, uh, block pruning. Uh, to do block pruning, uh, we select uh, several MLP layers or several uh, head into the attention block, prune it, throw it over, uh, and obtain a model with the smaller uh, with the small size. Uh, so, uh, how we can apply singular value decomposition into to the our fully connected layer? Every fully connected layer has a weight, matrix weight, with the size dimension input multiplied to dimension output. And uh, we can uh, represent this uh, matrix weight uh, with, uh, sing in a single value form uh, with the two factor matrices U, uh, we transposed, and with the diagonal matrix sigma, which contains of uh, singular values. Uh, to make a um, a uh, shorted version, compressed version of which we can select the uh, R, the R most uh, significant singular value into the sigma, uh, the R uh, first row into the U matrix, and the R col column into the uh, V transpose matrix. And we obtain the compressed version of our decomposition, truncated version. 
uh, so uh, having initial linear weight W, uh, we uh, can uh, um, now we can obtain two new weights W2, which is multiplication of a truncated version of a factor u multiplied to square root uh, to the uh, matrix sigma and uh, w1 which is multiplication of uh, square root of matrix sigma to the truncated version of factor matrix v the compression rate is the following and uh, into the denominator we have a multiplication of input and out in output um, dimension of the initial matrix and uh, as, as a denominator we have uh, some of the multiplication of uh, weight uh, matrix uh, of the size of this and this weight matrices uh, to understand how we can deal with uh, tensor compression we should uh, go into the some tensor notation uh, so tensor is a multidimensional array. Uh, it is a big uh, cube which have uh, n axes, where n is a number of dimension. And uh, this uh, big uh, big cube, this uh, big uh, um, object, uh, can suffer from uh, 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 can suffer of having a lot of parameters. So we um, can obtain some tensor compression technique to represent this tensor into the uh, more proper, more, more compressed way. Uh, in, a, uh, in other words, uh, we represent the tensor, a multidimensional array, as a set uh, of uh, as a set of factor object which uh, usually have uh, less di less dimensions uh, than the initial tensor and because of this object have less dimension uh, we have uh, a compression comparing to the initial our tensor uh, so uh, some notation we uh, want to know this is a, uh, by this letter uh, tensor is defined by uh, this uh, letter with uh, n where, where n is a number of dimension into the tensor. Uh, the tensor in tri is defined, uh, one element inside the tensor. Uh, this is the um, regular definition uh, for the uh, core, ten core tensor in some decomposition. So when we decompose some tensor into the set of uh, uh, object with low dimensions, uh, we, uh, um, this object usually represented by this letter. Uh, this is matrix and vector, and this is um, this is the definition for a modern matrization or unfolding operation of a tensor. Uh, what is uh, unfolding operation? Uh, when we make unfolding, we um, create a matrix based on our tensor. In other words, uh, we have tensor with n dimension. In this slide, we have a tensor with dimension number three. And we select one dimension and scratch our tensor alongside the selected dimension, like harmonic. And uh, we have matrix, and this matrix is depend on the initial tensor and on the axis alongside we scratched it. So if a tensor have uh, has three dimension, we uh, has um, three different matrices by unfolding every dimension uh, this tensor by every dimension. Uh, when we want to uh, represent tensor in more compressed way, uh, first uh, step is to define the way uh, in which we uh, will represent our tensor, and the next step will be to fill this set of containers um, by the uh, digit, by the value in a proper way. Uh, so we decided to uh, represent our um, matrix in tensor train matrix format with is an extension of tensor train format. What is tensor train format? Uh, this is when we represent our initial tensor by the set of uh, core tensor. Uh, every core, ten core tensor has dimension no more than three. So um, out uh, core tensor has dimension two, but inner core tensor has dimension three. Uh, the number of core tensor, the number of tensor into the sequence is equal to the number of dimension into the tensor. So here we have a tensor with dimension equal to three, and we have three core tensors. Uh, to um, calculate, to count 
their uh, entry inside the uh, corresponding tensor, for, uh, we should uh, do the same. For example, we want to calculate entry uh, by uh, um, under the indexes 2, 3, 1. Uh, we should select the second slice here from the second core, uh, the third slice here for the uh, oh, sorry for the first core, uh, the second slice for, from the first core, the third slice from the second core, and the first slice from the last core. Multiply it, and after multiplication, we obtain an um, object with size uh, one, uh, with number of dimensions one. Uh, we obtain a point, the proper point. Uh, so uh, this is the formula uh, which we use to calculate every entry of the tensor and uh, we also should say that uh, every tensor has no more than uh, three dimensions. Uh, the, adjust, um, the outer dimension is rank. Uh, rank uh, is a dimension uh, alongside uh, the uh, neighbor tensor uh, will be uh, multiplying. So um, rank 2 uh, here and rank uh, uh, 2 here is equal. Uh, uh, the first rank uh, into the outer tensor is equal to 1. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, rank is, uh, are usually different. So we uh, obtain tensor train decomposition with different ranks. But uh, for simplicity of formula, for, for simplicity of calculation, all ranks uh, are uh, usually set at equal to each other and equal to, uh, to R. How, uh, okay, uh, we select our form, uh, in which case we will represent our tensor, and now we should uh, understand uh, which digit should be in our core tensor, how to do it. Uh, uh, there are several uh, algorithms for uh, uh, tensor train compression, and the, one of the most famous is TTSVD, which is provided by Ivan Asledits. Uh, how it works? Um, we have initial tensor, and uh, we should do initial tensor with uh, d axis, and we should do these steps. On every step, so we unfold our tensor over the selected axis. Uh, this is unfolding. Uh, then we apply to the obtained matrix uh, SVD, uh, obtaining uh, U, uh, VT, and sigma truncated to the corresponding rank. Uh, this rank should be uh, the rank of tensor train decomposition. Uh, we obtain the corresponding core tensor by reshaping factor matrix U, uh, and uh, the rest of our factors, we multiply it, and uh, um, the, uh, this multiplication go to the next step. So on the next step, we will unfold uh, this tensor instead of the initial. Uh, so we do it uh, uh, the times which equal the, uh, to the number of axes into the tensor and obtain uh, the um, number of cores which is equal to the number of axes into the tensor. Unfortunately, we cannot apply it to the um, neural network architecture and for neural network uh, we should use the uh, expansion of the tensor train format and the train matrix format. Uh, tensor train matrix formula is, uh, format is very simple, similar to tensor train format uh, instead of uh, two point. Um, if we are talking about tensor train representation, we're usually talking about tensor over the point. If we are talking about tensor train matrix representation, we are usually talking about tensor over matrix. So we have no point with the um, dimensionality one, but matrix with dimensionality two. And uh, now our index y turns into the index tuple. Uh, so now we have uh, no core with dimension maximum three, but uh, we have uh, n cores with uh, maximum dimension equal to four. Uh, and uh, our formula of calculating entry turn out to be this one. So we have two index instead of uh, one, and uh, uh, and we have a core tensor with the biggest dimensions and uh, into the tensor train. How we um, okay? Uh, we decided uh, which form we will with which form we will work. Now we have matrix 
with di uh, size dimension input and dimension output. Uh, then we uh, factorize dimension into the factors. Our factors will be the initial shape of our course. And uh, then we reshaped in this matrix into the uh, two n dimensional object, two n dimensional tensor. We should permute axis of these objects, so the required axis from the tuple of the indexes are adjacent. And uh, when we obtain tensor C by reshaping permute, we apply tensor train SVD algorithm on this. The compression rate is this. Uh, so into the denominator, we have multiplying of all factors, uh, which in uh, real life is a multiplication of dimension input and dimension output. And here uh, we have a sum of uh, multiplication of dimension of every core tensor. Tensors. Uh, so, uh, returning to our Burton Bart model, uh, we decided to see uh, its behavior on uh, three compression rates. Uh, and for every compression rate, uh, we, dis uh, we uh, selected the proper rank for SVD, for truncated SVD decomposition, and for tensor train matrix decomposition. So if we want to update, for example, uh, 69 million uh, into the BERT, uh, we should apply SVD with this rank and TTM with this rank. Uh, SVD is uh, quite simple. We have uh, two linear layers, a sequential linear layer instead of one. And in TTM, uh, we decided uh, to um, represent our matrix as a set of four cores with uh, these uh, shapes. Uh, so into the TTM algorithm, we can vary the number of cores too. So we can represent our matrix as a three cores, as a four cores, or as a five, as, if you want. Uh, so uh, with these shapes, uh, where uh, R, where our rank, uh, we take from this table. And uh, we choose uh, J, K, uh, that uh, J multiply K are approximately equal uh, among all tensors inside the um, sequence of core tensors. Uh, okay, uh, we were working with pre-train uh, transformer-based language models, and when we apply the composition, of course, our quality has dropped significantly. Uh, and so we decided to align uh, task objective, which we used to obtain some decomposition of the given matrices, with task objective, uh, which we have um, on our downstream task, with which our model uh, is working. To do this, uh, we decided to inject Fisher information into the our single uh, into the our decomposition algorithm. Uh, Fisher information is a way of measuring the amount of information that an observable random variable X carries about an unknown parameter theta of a distribution that models X. In other words, uh, we have a set of uh, we have some data set which consists of number of um, object, and uh, on th on the certain object model gave uh, some uh, prediction. Uh, so we can calculate loss on this prediction, and in this loss, um, ex uh, in explicitly contains information about uh, some parameters inside the model. Uh, so. Uh, uh, Fisher information is defined as here. This is a partial derivative um, over the probability, uh, which uh, over the probability of the output which model gave, uh, which model gives uh, on the certain um, certain object into the into the data set uh, with uh, resp with respect to double uh, uh, v double v in this formula is a weight inside uh, our layer. And we can approximate this in this way. Uh, so we calculate at loss on every object, uh, take a derivative, and, uh, uh, calculate, and, uh, and calculate the expect mathematical expectation. Uh, so uh, we obtained IV. IV is a uh, matrix of Fisher information which has the similar size as our initial matrix V, V is a matrix of uh, fully connected layers. Uh, so 
uh, we multiply this matrix by matrix uh, of fission formation and obtain uh, SVD, singular value decomposition on this multiplication. And uh, uh, we uh, should also multiply uh, U factor to the uh, inverted um, matrix of, uh, of fission formation. Uh, in this way, we inject information of the output of the model, inject of the task objective into the singular value decomposition algorithm. Okay, uh, what we should do with uh, tensor train matrix algorithm? Uh, it's very simple. Uh, as you know, tensor train matrix algorithm uh, is a um, um, based on tensor train algorithm and tensor train decomposition algorithm is is in fact a set of uh, several SVD. Uh, so if we have Fisher matrix uh, I double V, uh, we do with this matrix the same operation as we do with matrix V to obtain our tensor. And uh, uh, then we unfold tensor based on matrix V and unfold tensor based on matrix uh, IV. Uh, and we have two matrices and do with two matrices the same things that we do here. So uh, into the uh, tensor train SVD decomposition algorithm, we have several set of SVD steps and uh, uh, into the SVD steps, we do the same thing that we do here. And uh, by this way, uh, we inject our fission formation into the tensor train matrix uh, approaches. Um, Okay, uh, we define for a uh, decomposition technique uh, that we shown uh, th that we have seen before, uh, and uh, then we started to evaluate it. The first evaluation point uh, was built. Uh, we evaluate our um, method uh, for the natural language understanding uh, task, GLUE benchmark. Uh, GLUE benchmark is a benchmark which consists of language acceptance, sentiment analysis, paraphrasing, semantic similarity, natural language inference tasks. Uh, we firstly fine tune our model over of ever, over every task from benchmark for one epoch. Then we compressed a fully connected layer using one of four techniques: uh, SVD, FV, SVD, TTM, FV, TTM. And uh, then we uh, fine tune our model again during one epoch, and we obtain this score. And uh, the score can show that on the uh, big compression rate, this. Uh, this part of table, um, the best performance uh, comes from TTM and Fisher weighted TTM approaches, but on the medium compression rate and uh, um, higher co and lower compression rate, the best performance comes from SVD and Fisher weighted SVD approaches. And also, when we apply fission formation into one of the SVD or TTM algorithm, we usually have an uh, increase in our performance, increasing in uh, model. Uh, accuracy or uh, some other scores. The next point uh, was um, sequence to sequence, uh, was evaluation of sequence to sequence model BART. And uh, the uh, first uh, task for BART was paraphrasing. Uh, we um, made paraphrasing of paradox data set. In this data set, we have a pair of um, sentences. Uh, the first sentence is uh, looks like some iteration and uh, the uh, sentence we want to obtain should look more polite than the initial phrase. Uh, on this data set, uh, uh, four metrics are works. The first is style transfer accuracy, how accurate uh, we uh, fit into the uh, polite uh, mode. Uh, similarity, how similar uh, the meaning of, the, of this and uh, these uh, sentences. And uh, fluency of generated text. And the last metric is J joint score. This is a multiplication of these uh, three metrics. Uh, on this data set, uh, the uh, best score uh, usually comes on every compression rate, comes from Fisher weighted SVD. And uh, Fisher weighted SVD uh, gives um, um, the great boost, uh, gives a great increase in, uh, into the performance according to other, um, according to other approaches. Um, the last um, evaluation point is also sequence to sequence model BART, and we uh, um, try to train BART to provide a summarization 
um, we have a data set XSUM, which consists of several hundred uh, thousand of BBC articles and a single sentence which uh, provides summary of these articles. And on this uh, data set, uh, um, so the, the result of this data set imitates the result on the glue. Uh, the best score on the uh, high compression rate uh, is provided by uh, fit forward TTM. So, uh, added fish information into the um, our decomposition algorithm also provide some boosting scores. Uh, on a high compression rate, the bad scores come from fish weighted TTM. Uh, on the medium and low compression rate, the best score come from fish weighted SVD. Uh, so there is a graphic uh, for a different task for glue benchmark for BERT. And uh, uh, on this graphic, you can see uh, the uh, main um, the main tendency of the whole work. Uh, red is a SVD, blue is a Fisher weighted uh, SVD, uh, green is TTM, um, yellow is Fisher weighted TTM. Uh, so uh, usually the best score is for Fisher weighted SVD, but uh, on the several tasks, on the um, high compression rate, which uh, which is described by the uh, right part of this graphic, of every graphic, uh, the best score uh, e uh, goes to the uh, TTM or Fisher weighted TTM. So this is the uh, rest of uh, our glue um, um, tasks. And this is the average task of the old glue. Uh, so, as a result, uh, we take four different techniques for compression of fully connected layers in BERT and BART models. At different compression level, different technique can give better or worse result. Um, and uh, usually for um, BERT uh, on glue benchmark and BART for XSUM uh, on the high compression rate uh, TTM, uh, Fisher weighted TTM provides the best score. In other variants of compression, uh, Fisher weighted SVD provides the best score. And the alignment of the task and the decomposition objective by injecting Fisher weighted information inside uh, to the decomposition algorithm uh, signif can significantly improve the performance of the compressed model. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the talk. Not just in the topic, but also very nice talk. Uh, very simple and uh, clear. Uh, 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 my question is about uh, your opinion about this relation. Because one of your slides, uh, you compare it to BERT. And it seems that the compression rate are always the same, but the performance boost is not that uh, high. What do you think about this? Uh, I think that uh, distillation is uh, quite good technique, and uh, distillation uh, is good uh, when you train your distill model towards the desired task. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, you can say, okay, I want to obtain distilled version of BERT, uh, I train distilled version of BERT to the task of the of the initial build, uh, or to the task of uh, natural language understanding. And on natural language understanding, distillation uh, can provide a good score, but when you vary task um, on the other type of task, uh, distillation uh, can uh, can provide not very good score. And uh, our method uh, um, give approximately this, uh, gives approximately the same result over all set of tasks. Yes, and to them too. You use this parameter throughout this compression layers everywhere you use the same parameter. You think that this notion of the parameterized installation kind of thing is better? I don't think so. Um, uh, you mean the 
compress different layer or inside with different trunks and with different shapes uh, it can make sense uh, and uh, we made um, some research which is out of scope of this presentation which uh, can see that uh, some layers inside the TTM and BART, uh, not sorry, into the BART, BART or GPT uh, can be less compressible according to 3D and TTM and can be uh, worse compressible. It can be seen by uh, C to the it's a single value spectrum. Uh, and of course, it makes sense. It can give some boost, uh, but uh, it's quite uh, difficult. Uh, and uh, we decided to set uh, one rank to the whole model. So I have a question about, uh, well, it, it, we have now age of uh, large language models and the popular method of compressing them is uh, quantization. And there is, a, well, there is no studies, but there is an evidence about that um, larger models are easier to compress. And so uh, have you conducted some ablations about uh, the scales? Well, I saw a BART base. Maybe you uh, conducted some experiments with BART large. Maybe it was better or for compression. Uh, I mean, uh, the... Um, the model with large number of parameters can be compressed better, yes? Um, no, I haven't, self, uh, I haven't seen yeah. such paper which provides such experiment. Uh, oh, I only uh, uh, have seen a paper from uh, uh, Open, oh, no, no, sorry, from Meta about um, um, about binding between the number of parameters into the model uh, and uh, number of tokens into the data set on which you train your model uh, with uh, their uh, different uh, scores, with the different metrics, uh, and uh, uh, people proved uh, that uh, this, um, this function is uh, logarithmic. Uh, but unfortunately, I um, haven't uh, read any paper which uh, uh, can directly uh, prove that uh, we can compress so the large language model is better compressible than uh, less large language models. Yeah, and a follow up question uh, well, about all this uh, decomposition. There are some uh, related work, well, uh, much older, about SVD decomposition, and they showed that uh, after decomp decomposing the model, if you uh, run about uh, one epoch of pre training, uh, it will perform better. Have you done this, uh, something similar in, the, in your ablations? If we train for oh, yes, well, yes. So and it's true. <laughs> so it does help. Yes, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you. It's uh, very depend on the size of um, task we uh, selected. Uh, so people usually evaluate a large model on not very uh, big data set and uh, when we are working with not very big data set one uh, epoch is really enough uh, to um, to set model to some uh, good point yeah uh, another question uh, first of all thank you for your talk and uh, uh, I'm also curious about how your work is compared to quantization, because like in the field of large language models nowadays, quantization is very popular. And I know that, uh, for example, 16 uh, models trained in 16-bit precision, uh, uh, they are like, uh, can be compressed, for example, to four bits uh, almost without losing much quality. So basically we'll lose something like one, two percent of perplexity uh, for 25 percent uh, compression rates. So I'm curious how your approach is compared to, to these uh, advancements. Um, you asked about uh, uh, um, comparison of uh, quantization and um, my approach or mm -hmm. can we apply our approach with quantization? Uh, comparison. So which one is better? Uh, I suppose we have information in slides uh, because uh, we uh, didn't compare with 4-bit quantization but for uh, 60, 60 floating point uh, and uh, mm, we can see that uh, for exam uh, the, our approach provides the best score than uh, FP evaluation, this, uh, 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 this one, uh, this, uh, this row. Uh, into the um, paraphrasing, 
uh, paraphrasing uh, something change and uh, FP16 provides the best score than every of our approaches. Yeah, I got it. Uh, yeah, I think one issue here is that uh, here we see like naive. Uh, so basically all the weights were in float uh, 32 and were naively converted to float uh, 16. But uh, like these new approaches, uh, they uh, kind of smart. Uh, for example, they take outliers and uh, they quantize like uh, some percent of outliers differently and so on. And they provide like uh, um, yeah, I think it may be interesting for you to compare with them because like they uh, provide like really good compression rates uh, without uh, uh, any significant harms to quality. Yeah, now that uh, we have more sophisticated way, uh, ways of uh, uh, quantization and uh, I think it's really interesting, yes, to compare with this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, this is a really interesting alternative approach. Hello, dear colleagues. Uh, today I'd like to uh, present to you uh, the results of um, our uh, research, uh, which was devoted uh, to the uh, development of the um, ETM recommendation system. Uh, the title of uh, our paper is um, on the slide. Um, the authors of uh, the paper are me, uh, Dmitry Hernakleev, and uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Pavel Praslavsky. Uh, let us begin uh, with the main idea uh, behind uh, our study. As uh, most, most of us probably know, uh, idioms uh, are quite an essential part uh, of many languages. Um, and uh, native speakers uh, usually tend to uh, use them in certain circumstances. Uh, because idioms um, enhance uh, the fluency of speech and um, the expressiveness of speech. Uh, however, mm, non-native speakers uh, may sometimes uh, struggle uh, to find an appropriate uh, idiom for uh, some contexts. Uh, also, I'd like to mention here that uh, nowadays become more and more popular uh, automated uh, writing assistants. Uh, writing assistants, uh, some of which are a powered already, by the way, um, like uh, Depel and Grammarly, uh, are able not only to uh, correct mistakes, uh, uh, grammar mistakes or spelling mistakes, but also uh, they are able to improve uh, the style and uh, suggest uh, continuations uh, for the entered text. Uh, and so here we come to the motivation of uh, our research. We aimed to suggest a system uh, which is able to recommend uh, an idiom for a given context. Uh, on the upper image, uh, you can see uh, an example of a uh, writing assistant, and below uh, there's a kind of simplified uh, scheme of uh, what uh, a desired uh, automated system should look like and, and how it should uh, function. Uh, for the purpose of our study, we obviously needed um, data. And by this, I mean a set of idiomatic expressions and um, contexts uh, uh, which contain these uh, idioms. Uh, based on the literature uh, review, we have uh, chosen EPI dataset, uh, uh, which is uh, the basic corpora in our uh, study. Uh, we have chosen uh, it uh, because of the several reasons. Uh, firstly, it is the second largest uh, freely available dataset. 
Uh, another reason uh, is uh, that it contains definitions for uh, the idioms um, that are presented in this corpora. Uh, table at the top uh, of the slide uh, contains uh, several uh, examples uh, from this data set. Uh, however, this data set required uh, uh, some sort of preprocessing, um, which is described in detail in our paper. Uh, after it, uh, we uh, have split uh, the result the resulting data set uh, into train and test uh, subsets and uh, in the 80 to 20 ratio with uh, stratification, uh, just to make sure that uh, all the unique uh, idioms are represented in both sets. Uh, also, I'd like to mention here that uh, the test set is uh, fixed uh, for all uh, configurations, uh, which I'm going to uh, describe uh, further um, to to have a right to compare uh, different um, configurations. Uh, during the experimental uh, part of our research, uh, we fine-tuned one of the uh, considered model. And in order to make it uh, more robust, uh, we required additional data. To get uh, more context for our uh, idioms, we have used uh, the Guardian API, which um, provides a handy interface uh, to parse um, articles published uh, in the Guardian newspaper. Uh, this allowed us to uh, obtain almost uh, 25,000 uh, additional sentences. And uh, therefore, we have increased uh, our initial uh, corpora by more than two and a half times. The graph uh, on the right uh, side uh, of, the, of the slide uh, presents two distributions of the number of different contexts uh, per idiom uh, before and after the parsing process. Uh, on this slide, uh, you can see a scheme which represents uh, our proposed approach. Our proposed uh, approach is uh, based mainly on the uh, semantic uh, similarity search uh, ideology. Uh, we obtain embeddings for the input sentence and uh, all, all of the collection sentences. Um, in input uh, sentences are also called uh, queries in the terms of uh, semantic similarity task. And the collection sentences are called uh, documents. Uh, then we uh, obtain embeddings using some model for uh, both of these uh, uh, input sentences and collection uh, instances. And then we uh, rank uh, the collection items based on cosine similarity uh, to the query and take the corresponding idioms uh, as uh, recommendations. Uh, the main me metric in our research uh, was mean reciprocal rank. Just in case if someone is unfamiliar with it, uh, here is a form formula. Uh, now, before we move uh, further, I'd like to mention here uh, just one more point related to the test set. Uh, it's obvious that when our approach is used on inference, we um, receive sentences without uh, idioms, so we remove uh, original idioms from all of the test, uh, test sentences. Uh, it's illustrated uh, on this. Uh, scheme. Uh, now let's uh, return back to this uh, to, to our main, main scheme. We can conclude uh, from this scheme that uh, 
our algorithm has only two key parameters uh, which can be varied. Um, the collection on which uh, the semantic search is performed and uh, the model which is used to obtain the embeddings. So using different uh, collections and models, uh, we obtain uh, various uh, configurations of our main uh, approach. Uh, let's uh, discuss uh, different collections first. In our research, uh, we consider uh, four uh, different collections. Uh, the first is called idioms, and it consists only of uh, the unique idioms from the initial data, data set uh, themselves. Uh, then we have uh, idioms plus deaths uh, collection, which consists uh, from um, idioms with uh, concatenated uh, uh, corresponding definitions uh, for these idi idiomatic expressions. Uh, then we have sentences collection, which consists uh, of the uh, sentences from the train set. Uh, and finally, sentences plus plus collection, which consists uh, um, from the instances from uh, the sentences collection. So it's basically uh, just a sentences collection, uh, which was uh, enlarged uh, or extended with uh, examples uh, from uh, the Guardian uh, API. Uh, in the tables uh, on the slide, you can see um, some examples from, from the collections that I've mentioned. Uh, now let's switch to the models. In our study, we employ a uh, pre-trained uh, on the Google News uh, dataset word to vec model from the Kinsin uh, library as a baseline model, uh, just to establish some kind of um, R um, against which we could compare um, for the uh, configurations. Uh, in the case of uh, the word to web model, uh, top 10 sentence uh, embeddings, uh, we averaged uh, embeddings of the words in the sentence. Uh, but the main model in our uh, research was uh, sentence birth model. Uh, since it is considered uh, a state-of-the-art model in the task of uh, semantic similarity search. Uh, the scheme on the right uh, side of the slide uh, presents uh, sentence bird architecture at inference, just as a reminder. Uh, also, in our uh, research, uh, we uh, use uh, several sentence birth models uh, straight out of the box uh, from the sentence tr transformer um, uh, framework, uh, which includes uh, MiniLM model, uh, sentence bird based on MiniLM model, uh, sentence bird based, based on distiller bird uh, and MPNet. Uh, besides, uh, we also uh, fine-tuned uh, uh, sentence bird model uh, based on distiller bird, which is uh, noted as distiller bird of plus, uh, to obviously achieve uh, better results. Uh, now let's talk, uh, let, let's talk about uh, the fine-tuning process of the distiller bird model. As I've uh, earlier, as I've said earlier, uh, we have parsed additional data. Uh, so we join our initial uh, train from from the EPI uh, data set with uh, contexts uh, that we have collected from the Guardian. Uh, then we uh, split the, uh, this uh, new set into new uh, train set and validation set. Uh, 
in the ratio of uh, 90 to 10, uh, again with certification. Uh, then uh, we create so-called uh, positive and negative pairs. Uh, to create a positive pair uh, for uh, a sentence from new train set, uh, we matched a sentence with another random sentence from the new train set uh, with the same idiom. And then we have removed um, uh, the idiom from the first sentence. Uh, the process uh, for uh, uh, creation of uh, negative pairs was uh, identical, except that uh, we matched uh, two sentences with different idioms. Uh, this uh, process is illustrated uh, in the table uh, at the bottom of the slide. On the right side of the slide, you can see uh, hyperparameters uh, we have used for uh, fine tuning and uh, the graph, which uh, illustrates uh, the dynamics of the accuracy on train uh, across five epochs. Uh, so as we can observe, uh, at the fifth epoch, uh, accuracy reaches the plateau, so we have stopped uh, training. Now let's take a look at the final results. Uh, this table right here contains uh, MRR uh, scores for all uh, of our configurations. As we can see uh, in a green cell, uh, fine-tuned uh, distilled Roberta model uh, achieved uh, the highest the highest result overall on the idioms collection. Uh, as I've said earlier, we consider uh, word to uh, model uh, with sentences collection uh, as a baseline configuration. Uh, therefore, we can see uh, an 80% gain compared uh, to the baseline and 46% uh, gain over MPNet at sentences uh, configuration, which achieved uh, the highest MRR score before the fine-tuning process. Uh, also, uh, we can draw a conclusion uh, that MRR is uh, higher uh, than 0.5, which means that on average, uh, the correct idiom is ranked second. Uh, on this slide, you can see uh, examples of simple and difficult idioms for our best configuration. Uh, simple idioms are characterized by a high uh, average reciprocal rank, uh, averaged uh, over all uh, corresponding uh, sentences uh, from the test set. Uh, while average uh, reciprocal rank for difficult idioms uh, is, uh, is close to, to zero. Uh, as a possible explanation uh, for this uh, 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 for these variations in performance, I can mention that uh, first of all, um, some idioms uh, might be used in uh, a wider context or in a more complicated context. Um, or perhaps another reason is uh, it, it could be related uh, to uh, our uh, evaluation protocol uh, because we assume that uh, there is only one uh, suitable idiom uh, for each sentence, which uh, might be overly strict. Uh, however, these uh, hypotheses uh, are under researched, uh, and we plan to examine this phenomena in the future. As for the main results of our study, we'd like to highlight uh, that, first of all, we automatically expanded uh, EPI dataset uh, by more than two and a half times, and therefore we have created uh, basically a new uh, data set uh, for the task uh, of idiom recommendation 
um, for the English language. Uh, secondly, we present a fine-tuned SBERT model, particularly for the task of uh, idiom recommendation. Uh, thirdly, we present a novel approach, which is based on the semantic uh, similarity search and uh, implementation of uh, sentence BERT. And uh, also, we have examined uh, the suitability of uh, several neural models, uh, including word to egg and uh, sentence BERT uh, for the task of in-game recommendation. As uh, for the future plans, in the foreseeable future, we plan to uh, further expand uh, the data set uh because we have a hypothesis that uh, showing the model even more uh various uh, contexts uh on the training stage might result in even higher per performance and uh, secondly we would like to add uh, filters uh to prevent uh, some kind of um, inappropriate uh, recommendations uh thirdly we would like to uh analyze the impact of the context length uh, on the performance of our approach and experiment with contexts longer than uh, one sentence and finally we plan to uh, use some kind of uh, tool to filter sentences uh, which contain idioms uh, used in the literal sense because uh, in the initial EPI uh, data set, uh, some idiomatic expressions uh, were used almost exclusively in the literal sense. Uh, on this slide, you can see a QR code, uh, which leads to the code models and the um, extended data set, uh, which are all freely available. Uh, we invite uh, all of you to come and uh, see it. Uh, that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention. Okay. I'm ready to. Okay, any questions? Maybe we have time for one quick question because we're slightly out of time. Okay. Good, but I have many. <laughs> but yeah, I will try to, to do it quite fast. So my question is about the test set, because uh, there are multiple ways to split the test set. Sometimes you might use the sentences that were in the train with the same uh, uh, phrase, but it's not seen in the test set. So like, can you please elaborate a little bit how the test set was split, created? Thanks. And thank you for your talk. It was just a random split. We didn't have no duplicates because we have removed it, if, you, if I heard your question right. Uh, so it was just a random split. Uh, we just have some uh, contexts uh, containing uh, idioms in the train set and uh, some contexts uh, with uh, without idioms in the test set, which we want to uh, uh, find the, uh, the correct idiom for. Okay, thank you. And one more quick question. Like, do you have, uh, I think that the scores that are higher for the uh, this fine tuning step is that because the structure might be quite evident for the model because some phrases you cannot like food for thought, maybe use only with some preposition that you don't hide and some uh, phrases that use a verb that could not even evidently according to the grammar cannot be used there so like uh probably like have you thought about that and maybe it's going to be for future work or maybe there's there are some examples that they were uh, phrases that were correct but not identified by the test set thanks uh, yeah, yeah. As for, the, as for the first uh, part of the question, yes, uh, it's uh, up to the further uh, research. Uh, we have thought about it, but we haven't uh, 
got enough time to uh, check all the hypotheses. Uh, some of them are described uh, in our paper, but uh, it's too. It's not. Uh, it's hard to put them in a few words. So I just can. I can just invite you to read our paper. Um, and as uh, for uh, the second part, I mentioned uh, that uh, our uh, evaluation protocol isn't. Uh, quite as logical uh, because uh, we don't uh, consider the fact that uh, some contexts uh, uh, may contain um, more than uh, one appropriate idiom. So there is not only one correct uh, answer. So it's it, it means only that the fact that uh, we have kind of uh, lower uh, estimation uh, for our approach, it might be even better. Okay, thank you. Let's thank the speaker again. And the session is over. See you all tomorrow.